Welcome, I'm Richard D. Hall and I'm here in Portugal, Praia de Luz. Now the reason why I've come here is because I'm making a series of documentaries about the Madeleine McCann case. Why am I making programs about that? Well, it's because I'm sick and tired of misleading media headlines about the incident. In these films, I will expose the hard facts about the incident and also what has happened since the incident. The documentaries clearly show the last place to get truthful information from is mainstream media and I will also expose those who are controlling mainstream media. Madeleine McCann, the three-year-old British girl abducted from her bed by a stranger between 9pm and 10pm on Thursday the 3rd of May 2007. It's become one of the most enduring mysteries of our time. Even the McCann's ever-present spokesman, Clarence Mitchell, whom we'll hear quite a bit more about in this documentary, admitted back in 2011 that her disappearance remained, quote, a complete mystery. Under British law, a person who has been missing for seven years or more may be declared dead. A coroner's court has the power, upon application by a relative or other interested person, to declare that a missing person is to be treated as deceased. The McCanns raised millions of pounds to search for Madeleine. The McCanns have spent millions on a series of private detective agencies. The McCanns have spent many more millions on a series of public relations advisers and lawyers. After all this, it seems we are not an inch further forward in terms of knowing how Madeleine disappeared and what may have happened to her. It's a story that has sold millions of extra tabloid newspapers and to this day deeply divides people, even within a family. In one corner, so to speak, are the McCanns, their fleet of public relations experts and lawyers and Scotland Yard, whose review and investigation has already lasted nearly three years and cost around £7 million. Their position is clear. Madeline was abducted from her bed by a stranger. The Portuguese investigation was bungled and wrongly framed them, and the Portuguese Attorney General has cleared them. They are all continuing the search for Madeline, whether she is alive or dead. But the McCanns face an array of opposition. The Portuguese detective who investigated Madeline's disappearance pulled the McCanns in for questioning and made them suspects in their own daughter's disappearance. He wrote a book on the case pointedly titled The Truth of the Lie. He claimed that the evidence suggested that Madeline had died in her parents' apartment and that the McCanns arranged to hide her body and falsely claim that she was abducted. Many agree with him, not least former detective John Stoker, who led the inquiry into the Royal Ulster Constabulary's controversial shoot-to-kill policy. Way back in 2007, he declared, the McCanns are hiding a big secret. One of my fascinations about this case is why the mainstream media are so reluctant to discuss the details. On TV, their account of events is rarely challenged in depth. They are, in effect, given a platform, despite the nagging questions that remain. In this series of documentaries, we'll be examining the facts in greater detail than has ever been done on film. The material will inevitably raise questions in your minds, and that's what it's meant to do. My purpose is to shed some penetrating light into dark secretive areas that the mainstream media dare not touch. In part one and two, we're going to examine the two main areas of evidence that led to the McCanns being pulled in for questioning. First of all, some of the changes of story and the contradictions. Secondly, the intelligence provided by two police dogs trained by world sniffer dog expert Mr. Martin Grime, who now works for the FBI. Next, we'll have a look at the controversial record of the detective agencies employed by the McCanns. And finally, we'll probe the extraordinary amount of top-level help the McCanns have had from the British government and its intelligence agencies. In part two, we will pick up some of these issues in greater detail, focusing on the many changes of story and contradictions in the case, seeking to analyse and explain why there are so many. 
So let's start by a brief look at one key change of story over how the abductor is said to have gained access to the apartment and one major contradiction, the conflicting accounts of a visit said to have been paid by the McCann's friend, Dr. David Payne, to Kate McCann around 6.30 p.m. on the day Madeline was reported missing. So what was the original story that the McCanns gave to the press? Let's recall that it was an international story that developed with breakneck speed. According to the McCanns, Madeline was first discovered missing around 10 p.m. on Thursday the 3rd of May 2007. Half an hour to an hour later, they reported this to the Ocean Club reception, who in turn called in the police. By around 7 a.m. the following morning, just nine hours later, British news media were already reporting this mysterious disappearance. Some of them were briefed directly by friends of the McCanns, such as Jill Renwick, a friend of former Prime Minister Gordon Brown and his wife. During the early hours of Friday morning, the British print media summoned their overseas reporters to the Portuguese village of Praia de Luz, like John Clark, the editor of the expat Spanish newspaper, The Olive Press, who files reports for The Sun and The Daily Mail. He was summoned in the early hours of Friday morning and made a five-hour journey from his home in Ronda, Spain, to be in Praia de Luz before noon that day. It was an international media frenzy from day one. One of these early reports was carried by the BBC, who carried the comments of Trish Cameron, sister of Jerry McCann. The BBC reported that Mrs Cameron had received a telephone call from her 39-year-old brother, a consultant cardiologist, who was hysterical and crying his eyes out, she said. The last check at half past nine, they were all sound asleep, sleeping, windows shut, shutters shut. Kate went back at 10 o'clock to check. The front door was lying open. The window had been tampered with. The shutters had been jammed open or whatever you call it. And Madeline was missing. There is no doubt whatsoever that this was the story the McCanns wanted the press to report. An abductor, they claimed, had broken through the windows and shutters using a jemmy and had taken Madeline from their holiday apartment. The Guardian carried the following account of Kate McCann's father, Brian Healy. Jerry told me that when they went back, the shutters to the room were broken, they were jemmied up, and she was gone. The Mirror and the Times both carried a report from Madeline's godfather, filmmaker John Corner, who said that Kate McCann had phoned him in the middle of the night. He said she just blurted out that Madeline had been abducted. Kate said the shutters of the room were smashed, Madeline was missing. It looks as though someone has gone straight past the twins to get her. A family friend, Jill Renwick, told GMTV and The Independent that they were just watching the hotel room and going back every half hour and the shutters had been broken open and they had gone into the room and taken Madeline. So the McCanns then gave this account to four separate people. The nation was told first that there had been a violent break-in with the shutters being forced open with a jemmy, second that the front door had been locked but was now lying open and third, of course, that Madeline had been taken. But within just 24 hours, the McCann's initial accounts dramatically changed in several important aspects. I'll explain how they changed. We'll first of all examine Jerry McCann's first witness statement, made the very next day, Friday the 4th of May. He says that during the evening, both he and his wife checked on the children using a key to open the front door of their apartment. He explained how his wife Kate found Madeline missing on her 10 p.m. check and how he then rushed to the apartment and found the windows to the children's room open, the shutters raised and the curtains drawn open. There is now no mention of the front door lying open. Kate, who of course was the one to raise the alarm and therefore entered the apartment before Jerry, says exactly the same about the children's room. The window open, the shutters raised and the curtains open. She adds that she is certain they were all closed when they left at 8.30pm that evening to dine at the Tapas restaurant. An interesting point to note is that although Jerry was interviewed alone by the police, Jerry and his advisers persuaded the police for him to sit behind Kate whilst she was being interviewed. An unusual concession. On page 91 of her book on the case called Madeline, she writes that Jerry would place a hand on my shoulder from time to time or give me a reassuring squeeze. But the entire claim of an open window, of a raised and jemmied shutter, and of curtains wide open was blown apart hours after Jerry and Kate made their statements. 
The Independent, for example, quoted John Hill, the manager of the Ocean Club in Praia de Luz, as saying, despite the report by a family friend that the shutters of the couple's apartment were broken, there was no sign that anyone had forced their way in while the McCanns ate at the tapas restaurant. It's still questionable whether it's an abduction. Later, Chief Inspector Oligario Sousa, the spokesman for the investigation, told British police officer Detective Inspector Kirby that the windows and the shutter had not been tampered with, adding that their mechanism makes them almost impossible to open from the outside. Later, pictures of the police examining the shutters were made available for the public to see. It was very clear that the shutters were not damaged. There was no support for the claims made by Jerry and Kate just hours after Madeline was reported missing that the shutters had been jemmied open. An even more dramatic change of story was to follow when the McCanns were asked to give second statements to the police on the 10th of May, six days later. Despite Jerry having clearly told police that during that evening they had on each occasion checked on the children, gone to the front door and used a key to get in, now they maintained that this was untrue. Instead, they claimed they left through the patio door, leaving it unlocked. Their claim of a violent break-in by an abductor through the children's bedroom had been proved to be false. Now they had to rapidly explain how the supposed abductor got into the apartment in the first place. We can see what Jerry now said in his second, much longer statement. The police report notes, despite what he said in his previous statements, he states now, and with certainty, that he left with Kate through the back door, the patio door, which he closed but did not lock, given that it is only possible to lock it from the inside. For good measure, Jerry now added that he was certain that he had closed the front door, but maintained that, quote, it was unlikely that it was locked. It was to be the TV documentary Searching for Madeline by Dispatches on the 18th of October 2007 that was to bring about a formal admission by Jerry and Kate McCann and their spokesman that the abductor could not have entered the premises via the window to the children's room. The programme effectively proved that there was no way anybody could break into the apartment and leave no forensic trace nor damage to the lightweight aluminium shutters, which are covered with a fine coating of polyurethane paint which marks very easily. David Barclay, the former head of physical evidence at the UK National Crime Operations Faculty, was quoted in the programme. He said, We must be very careful that we're not saying this is actually staging, but it's difficult to see how anybody could have interfered with those shutters from outside without leaving some trace. In fact, having looked at them, I think it's almost impossible. Shortly after this programme, which was highly sceptical of the McCann's version of events, their spokesman Clarence Mitchell made a remarkable statement, which I'll reproduce in full below, exactly as quoted in The Independent. The Independent article told its readers, the spokesman for the family of Madeleine McCann has reversed a statement made in the early days of the search for the missing child. In the early part of the hunt, friends and family members told journalists that the shutters in the apartment where the McCanns were staying had been broken. Then they quoted Mitchell, there was no evidence of a break-in. I'm not going into detail, but I can say that Kate and Jerry are firmly of the view that somebody got into the apartment and took Madeline out of the window as their means of escape, and to do that they did not necessarily have to tamper with anything. They got out of the window fairly easily. The McCanns had already asked us to believe that they had made a genuine error when they initially told police that they were entering the apartment by the front door. Now they were making a claim that many people found difficult to swallow. They now boldly suggested, via their spokesman, that the mystery abductor had calmly walked through an unlocked patio door. He is then supposed to have picked up Madeline from her bed and, as their spokesman said, taken her out of the window as his means of escape. On top of that, no one, apart from one of the McCann's close friends who was with them on holiday, saw any abductor, nor heard any abductor. If there really had been an abductor taking a child through the children's window, he left no forensic trace behind. The window in the children's room was quite small, about 2 foot 6 by 2 foot 6. It is hard to see how an abductor could have got through the window with a child without waking that child up. 
more to the point, why would the mystery abductor choose to climb through the window when he already knew he could simply walk out of either the unlocked patio door or the unlocked front door? The McCanns now had a further problem. How could they explain an abductor freely entering their apartment through a door and then deciding to climb with the child through a small window? Eventually the McCanns found an explanation, though this latest explanation proved to be even more bizarre than previous ones. In 2010 the McCanns were involved in a three-day libel trial in Portugal. This was a claim they had made against the author and publishers of a book about the case by Chief Detective Inspector Dr. Gonçal Amaral, who coordinated the initial investigation into Madeleine's disappearance. Some evidence was given during that trial which seriously embarrassed them. Dealing with the opened window and shutters, Kate McCann told the media on the 14th of January, As for the window, I described to the police officers exactly what I found that night as it was and is highly relevant. I knew that every little detail could be helpful in finding my daughter. The window, which is a ground floor window, was completely open and is large enough for a person to easily climb through it. Whether it had been opened for this purpose remains unknown. It could of course have been opened by the perpetrator when inside the apartment as a potential escape route or left open as a red herring. The McCanns seriously proposed that an abductor might have walked in through one of two unlocked doors in the property and either opened the windows and shutters of the children's room as a third potential escape route or, even more bizarrely, opened them just to confuse any investigators. If anything, Kate's book Madeline came up with an even more ridiculous scenario on page 131. She wrote, Perhaps the abductor had either come in or gone out via the window, not both. Perhaps he hadn't been through it at all, but had opened it to prepare an emergency escape route if needed, or merely to throw investigators off the scent. He could have been in and out of the apartment more than once between our visits. What we do now believe is that the abductor had very probably been into the room before Jerry's check. All these scenarios are, to say the least, highly improbable. In a moment I'll finish off this section on the initial changes of story by having a detailed look at the claims made by Kate McCann about what she saw and did when she entered the apartment that night and says she found Madeline gone. But first, I have mentioned the McCann's spokesman, Clarence Mitchell, once or twice. I hope to say much more about both him and the government's role in helping the McCann's on a future occasion. But for now, let me say a few pertinent things about him. At the time that Madeline was reported missing, Mitchell was head of the Blair government's powerful media machine, the Media Monitoring Unit, inside the Central Office of Information, known by many as the Central Office for Disinformation. On a salary in today's terms of over £100,000, he headed up a 40-strong media manipulation department that was costing taxpayers several millions of pounds a year. After he had been working for the McCanns for a year, he boasted to a Portuguese newspaper, L'Espresso, that his job was to control what comes out in the media. Before becoming the McCann spokesman, he had worked for the BBC for many years on some of the top crime stories of the time. The murders by Fred and Rosemary West, the Sower murders of Jessica Chapman and Holly Wells, and Jill Dando's murder, to name but three. Why was it that the highly paid boss of Tony Blair's feared media unit, reporting directly to the Cabinet Office at 10 Downing Street, was put in charge of handling the media storm around Madeleine McCann on the 6th of May 2007, just three days after Madeleine was reported missing? What was it that made the British government, just 16 days after that, transfer him to the Foreign Office and order him out to Praia de Luz in Portugal, where he stayed until the McCanns dashed home to England after the Portuguese police made them both formal suspects in the disappearance of Madeline? That month, September 2007, Clarence Mitchell was allowed to leave his highly paid civil service post in order to work full-time for the McCanns. For a year after that, he was at the centre of story after story about Madeline that appeared on the front pages of British tabloids. Many of them were stories apparently manufactured by Mitchell. There was one tale after another, and talk of suspects, persons of interest, and people we want to trace to eliminate from our inquiries, accompanied by lurid artist sketches of a variety of people claimed to have been lurking around the holiday village of Pride de Luz around the time the McCanns were there. 
nothing came of all these media stories as we know. But Mitchell succeeded in his aim of keeping the idea that Madeleine was abducted and may still be alive in the forefront of people's minds. But what Mitchell has done after he stopped working full time for the McCanns in September 2008 is also very interesting. He carried on working part time for the McCanns on a retainer said to be worth £30,000 a year but immediately obtained a job working as a reputation manager at Freud International. That company is owned and run by Matthew Freud, the son-in-law of media mogul Rupert Murdoch. It was becoming clear that Mitchell was closely connected to the Murdoch empire. In 2009, David Cameron famously met Rupert Murdoch on Murdoch's yacht in the Mediterranean. He was flown there in Matthew Freud's private jet. Weeks after that historic meeting, Murdoch, having for years told his newspapers like The Sun and The Times to back Labour, now dramatically switched sides and began backing Cameron's Conservatives to win the 2010 general election, which they did, though not obtaining an overall majority. At around the same time, Cameron appointed Andy Coulson, former editor of the News of the World, another Murdoch newspaper, as his director of communications. Coulson, of course, has been embroiled in the long-running phone-hacking trial at the Old Bailey, accused of illegally paying high-ranking police officers for juicy stories and illegally hacking people's phones. In March 2010, Cameron and Coulson appointed Mitchell as their deputy director of communications to help master the control of the media to win the general election for the Conservatives. So there we had a team made up of Cameron, a close personal friend and neighbour of Rebecca Brooks, then the chief executive officer of Murdoch's News International Empire, Coulson, former editor of one of Murdoch's newspapers, and Clarence Mitchell, chief media spinner for Blair, and a recent highly paid public relations consultant to the company owned and run by Murdoch's son-in-law. Mitchell was a man, therefore, who moved in the very highest echelons of the British political and media establishment. Just why was it necessary for him to be given a full-time job as public relations officer for the McCanns just three days after Madeleine went missing? After all, as far as anyone knew at the time, Madeleine could have been found any day. And has Mitchell's expensive input in the case, costing hundreds of thousands of pounds over the past seven years, found out anything useful about what really happened to Madeleine? The answer to that, so far, is no. But let's return to the specific subject matter in hand, the changes of story by the McCanns in their initial statements to the Portuguese police. Let's probe this a little deeper. In her May 2009 interview, Kate McCann gave her first detailed description of what she found when she checked on the children at around 10pm on the 3rd of May 2007. Among other things, she mentions what she says is Madeline's favourite toy, a pink soft toy called Cuddle Cat. Here's what Kate McCann said. I did my check about 10 o'clock and went in through the sliding patio doors and I just stood actually and I thought, oh, all quiet. And to be honest, I might have been tempted to turn round then, but I just noticed that the door, the bedroom door where the three children were sleeping, was open much further than we'd left it. I went to close it to about here and then as I got to here, it suddenly slammed. And then as I opened it, it was then that I just thought, I'll just look at the children. And I could see Sean and Emily in the cot. And then I was looking at Madeline's bed, which is here, and it was dark. And I was looking and I was thinking, is that, is that Madeline or is that the bedding? And I, I couldn't quite make her out. And it, it sounds really stupid now, but at the time I was thinking I didn't want to put the light on because I didn't want to wake them. And literally, as I went back in, the curtains of the bedroom, which were drawn, were closed. Whoosh, it was like a gust of wind, kind of just blew them open. And Cuddle Cat was still there, and a pink blanket was still there. I mean, I knew straight away that she'd uh, been taken, you know. Looking at this in more detail, first of all, she says that the door was further open than we left it. She means further open than when we left the children at 8.30pm to go down to dinner. The statement is complete nonsense for this reason. Kate may have remembered, so she says, leaving the door slightly open when they left for the restaurant at 8.30pm. 
but we know, according to their statements, that two other people had been in the apartment in the meantime, her husband Jerry, just after 9pm, and their friend, Dr Matthew Oldfield, so she would have no way of knowing how open these two had left the door to the children's room. The curtains were closed when they left them, she says. Then a gust of wind is said to have blown the curtains into the room, but photographs released by the Portuguese show one of the two curtains trapped against the wall down the side of a bed below the window. The other is seen behind a wicker chair. That is one sign that the curtains must have been arranged by someone in that position. Moreover, curtains that blow in the wind do not suddenly end up two or three feet apart, as we can see in the police photograph. They are folded, which means that someone has actually drawn them back. The right-hand curtain is more drawn back than the left. It was not a gust of wind which did this. With all these changes of story and contradictions, it is hardly surprising that the Portuguese police questioned the McCann's account very early on. We saw earlier that both of the McCann's reported that on arrival to their apartment at around 10pm, the shutter was raised and the windows were open. The window, by the way, is a sliding window. You open the catch and then one window slides in front of the other. If the abductor had really used the window as his means of exit, it would have been a very tight squeeze indeed to get through. But what this also means is that if there really had been a gust of wind, as the McCanns claimed, it would have blown one of the curtains. It is a further indication that the alleged crime scene was arranged. Furthermore, when the police examined the window frame for fingerprints, they only found one fingerprint. It was the fingerprint of Kate McCann. Let's examine one or two more aspects of the claims made by the McCanns about the state of the children's room when they found it that night. They first of all told police that the door to the children's room was completely open, but when Kate McCann was interviewed about this on TV, this changed to the door was left open a bit more than we had left it. As we discussed above, this statement was nonsense, as two other people had allegedly checked on the children during the evening, so the McCanns wouldn't know how open the door had been left anyway. In her book on the case, Madeline, Kate says the door was open quite wide. In her May 2009 interview, Kate McCann said this about the door allegedly slamming shut because of a gust of wind. The bedroom door, where the three children were sleeping, was open much further than we'd left it. I went to close it to about here, and then as I got to here, it suddenly <laughs> slammed. And then as I opened it, it was then that I just thought, I'll just look at the children. This is how she told the story to CNN. I just noticed that the, the door to the children's bedroom was quite far open and we always leave it just so it's slightly ajar just to let a little bit of light in. And I thought to myself, um, did Matt leave the door open at half nine? Because uh, Matt checked on them at half nine. Um, and I thought that must be what happened. So I went to, to close over the children's door and just as I was about to close it, it kind of slammed as if like a gust of wind had shut it. The same story is in her book on page 71. Then I noticed that the door to the children's bedroom was open quite wide, not how we had left it. At first I assumed that Matt must have moved it. I walked over and gently began to pull it too. Suddenly it slammed shut as if caught by a draft. We notice here first a bit of clever backfitting. The nonsense about the door being open wider than when we left it is changed. Now, she states, at first I assumed that Matt, a doctor friend of theirs, had moved it. It has taken her four years to add this bit to her story. A vital point to notice here is that the claims about the gust of wind and the door slamming shut were never in any of the McCann's original statements. These claims were added by them months later. This story of the alleged gust of wind, the curtains whooshing wide open and the door slamming shut, then featured heavily in a documentary shown by Channel 4 in May 2009, and in subsequent reconstructions, documentaries and TV interviews. The photographs taken by the Portuguese police show clearly that the curtains are hanging down and held firmly, one trapped down the side of the bed against the wall and the other behind the wicker chair. The folds in each curtain are clearly flattened against the wall of the furniture. This could not have happened due to an alleged gust of wind. The curtains have every appearance of having been deliberately arranged in that position and that is exactly what the original Portuguese police investigators decided. They said the alleged crime scene had been faked.
Now let's have a look at Kate McCann's first police statement, made on Friday the 4th of May, the day after Madeline was reported missing. The police statement says that she went into the apartment by the side door, which was closed but unlocked, and immediately noticed that the door to her children's bedroom was completely open. The window was also open, the shutters raised, and the curtains open, while she was certain of having closed them all, as she always did. But the photos of the children's room taken when the police arrive show the windows closed. They are the type that lock together automatically when closed and need a finger inserted into the black mechanism in the centre to release the catch. They also show the shutters in the almost closed position. The photos also show the curtains half closed, the left curtain slightly more closed than the right one. We can immediately see how this conflicts with Kate's claims that the shutters, window and curtains were all completely open. In Jerry's second statement, made on the 10th of May, he describes he found the window was open to one side, the shutters almost fully raised and the curtains drawn back. Again we can see how Jerry's claim that the shutters, window and curtains were all completely open conflicts with the state of these items when the Portuguese police arrive. On the 6th of September 2007, the day before she was declared a formal suspect by the Portuguese police, Kate answered police questions until the moment the police told her that they now wanted to ask her in detail about the events of the 3rd of May. At this point, Kate McCann immediately exercised her legal right to remain silent and said nothing more of evidential interest. So summarising, in the McCann's original statements the curtains were described by them as drawn back or fully open, but in the police photos they are only half drawn. In addition, as we've seen, the window is a sliding window, so only one half can be open, that window pane sliding in front of the other. A gust of wind would therefore disturb only one curtain, not both. Now let us examine the story around the children's bedroom door. In her police statement on the 4th of May, which was later confirmed by Jerry, Kate McCann says the children's bedroom door was completely open. But months later, they tell a very different story to journalists. Now it is, the door was open a bit more than we had left it. It's of interest to note that if we take these words at their face value, Kate is basically saying that she did not intend to look into the children's room until she says she noticed the door wider open than they had left it. It is hardly surprising when we consider this scene that the original Portuguese investigating team thought there were obvious signs that the scene in the children's room had been faked. If we look at the police photos, we see first of all that the bed Madeline is said to have slept in looks neat and tidy, with the corner neatly turned down. It does not immediately look like a bed that has been slept in, or one from which a child has been suddenly snatched. If we look at the curtains, it looks as though someone has tucked the curtains back down the crack between the bed and the wall, having first moved out the bed, arranged the curtains in position, and then pushing the bed back against the curtain. Moreover, although Kate claims that the curtains whooshed open and were drawn back, in the photos they clearly are not. Neither the whooshing of the wind nor the slamming of the door was originally reported by either Kate or Jerry McCann. Why was it that these claims were only raised in 2009, nearly two years after Madeline was reported missing? Finally, what was the weather like that night? Were there so-called gusts of wind, as Kate McCann claimed? It seems highly unlikely. We've had a look at the available weather records for that night. It was a cool night with a light breeze. At nearby Faro Airport, the maximum wind speed was a light force 3. At 10pm, Faro Airport recorded a wind speed of just 9 miles per hour. It hardly seems strong enough to cause a door to slam or to whoosh open a curtain which is found trapped behind a bed. There is one other very curious aspect about the weather that night. Several of the McCann's friends commented on how cool or cold it was. In fact, at about 9pm to 10pm, when the supposed abduction is claimed to have happened, the outside temperature was around 13 degrees centigrade. That's 55 in Fahrenheit. You would need warm clothing when outside. One of their friends, Jane Tanner, specifically commented on how cold it was and how she needed to wear a coat when going out, so she said, to check on her two children. Yet bizarrely, Jerry McCann in his statements claims it was a hot night. 
In a moment we'll check on some statements made about the weather that night, but first let's examine yet another contradiction in this case so full of changes of story and contradictions. In her book, Kate McCann describes how she and Jerry left the children when they sauntered down to the tapas bar to meet their friends. I took them all into their bedroom. Madeline got into her bed and then Emily Sean and I settled ourselves on top of it with our backs against the wall for our final story. Then we kissed the twins and kissed Madeline, who was already snuggled down with her princess blanket and cuddle cat, a soft toy she'd been given soon after she was born and never went to bed without. Snuggles down clearly conjures up an image of a child tucked up under her sheets and blankets, feeling all warm and cosy. You snuggle into or under something. But just a page further on in the book, Kate writes, Jerry left to do the first check just before 9.05 by his watch. He found Madeline lying there on her left-hand side, her legs under the covers, in exactly the same position as we'd left her. So when they left, Madeline had already, quote, snuggled down. That is how they left her. Jerry now says he found her, quote, in exactly the same position as we'd left her. But what does Jerry say? Now Madeline is reported to be on top of the bed with only her legs covered up. Lying on top of the bed with her legs under the covers cannot possibly be described as snuggled down. Even more bizarrely, if we now return to Jerry McCann's second statement to the police, made on the 10th of May 2007, concerning the bed where his daughter was on the night she disappeared, he says that she slept uncovered, as usual when it was hot with the bedclothes folded down. So even days after Madeline was reported missing, he tells the Portuguese police that Madeline slept on top of the bed because it was so hot, yet when Kate McCann published her book four years later, we are told that she was snuggled down in her bed when they left the children and headed out for their evening at the tapas bar. We've seen that the temperature around 8 to 9 p.m. that night was around 13 degrees centigrade. What other remarks did the McCanns and their friends make about the weather that night? On page 73 of her book, it was so cold and so windy. Now their friend Jane Tanner, referring to the person carrying a child, she says she saw that night. I just thought that child's not got any shoes on, you could see the feet. And, I just, and it was quite a cold night in Portugal in May, it's not actually that warm. I know I'd got a big jumper on and um, I come thinking, oh, that parent's not a particularly good parent, they've not wrapped them up. It was actually quite cold. In April 2008, Jane Tanner was re-interviewed in England by Leicestershire Police. In that interview, she was again asked about the weather that night. She said, yeah, and there were some people inside because it was quite chilly. It was actually quite, quite cold. I remember I was wearing, because it was cold, I'd got Russell's big jumper on, crop trousers and flip-flops. And yeah, it was quite, you know, sort of cold. I thought that the child might be cold. That's one reason why we didn't open the shutters, to open the window or anything in that room. It wasn't actually really hot at all. It was actually quite cloudy in the days and at night it was actually quite chilly. If there was any doubt about how cold it was that night, and indeed the rest of the week, the McCann's friend, Dr Russell O'Brien, said the nights were quite chilly. Another friend, Dr Matthew Oldfield, said in the evenings it was very cold. His wife, Rachel Oldfield, said it was really cold in the evenings. Another friend, Dr David Payne, said it was quite cold some nights and, you know, perhaps nearly too cold to be sat outside. Then look at his wife, Fiona Payne's statement. It was still very cold. Fiona Payne's mother, grandmother Diana Webster, also went on holiday with the Tapas Group and noted that when the children were brought up to our apartment, they would have to come out into the cold. So why, alone amongst his group of friends, does Jerry McCann insist it was so hot that Madeline lay on top of her bedclothes that night? Could it be because the police photographs shows a bed which shows few signs of having been slept in during the evening of the 3rd of May? Is that something he was perhaps struggling to explain? When Kate McCann was pulled in for questioning on the 7th of September 2007, just four months after Madeline had been reported missing, the first question she was asked was this. On the 3rd of May 2007, at around 10pm when you entered the apartment, what did you see? What did you do? Where did you search? What did you handle? She had a golden opportunity to tell the police what she saw and what she did, but instead she exercised her right not to comment. 
She was asked forty-seven more questions. She answered no comment to every one. The last question she was asked was, Are you aware of the fact by not answering these questions you may compromise the investigation which is trying to find out what happened to your daughter? Kate McCann did answer that one. She replied, Yes, if that is what the investigation thinks. After this unproductive interview, the Portuguese police made Kate and Arguida suspect in English. Three days after that interview, Dr. Conchalo Amaral's chief inspector, Tavares de Almeida, published a detailed interim report. It didn't pull any punches. This report was very clear in suggesting that Madeleine McCann had died in her parents' apartment and that the parents had covered up the truth and that they had conspired to hide the body. Writing of the alleged crime scene, he pronounced, There is strong evidence that the crime scene was altered and some furniture was moved around. Those changes are indications that the abduction was a stage-managed simulation. He also had something to say about the constant changes of story, contradictions and backfitting. In a section headed, The McCanns Evolved Their Story to Adapt to the Police Questions, he wrote, The media attention that has been given to the case and the search for information by the said media has led to an evolution of Madeleine's parents' statements. All the information that has been made public has contributed to the McCanns rebuilding and adapting their story to fit the eventual police questions. They have attempted to explain the forensic evidence that we have collected and are collecting. We had very clear objectives what we wanted and any parents would take the opportunity of trying to get information into the investigation. That there is no evidence that Madeline is dead and there's no evidence to implicate us in her death. Everything we have done during the last hundred days is focused on uh, the belief that Madeline was alive when she was abducted. That evening, did you give to your kids something like copal to help them sleep? You know, we're not going to comment on anything, but you know, there is absolutely no way we used any sedative drugs or anything like that. How do you feel now that Amaral's um, book is, is, is going to be on the shelves here? Yeah, so, well, you know, as we've already alluded to, anyone who is, wants to convince people that Madeline is dead without evidence to support it, their motives have to be questioned. Can you update people? Where are you now? Have you got any new leads? What's happening with your investigation? Well, I mean, I'd like to say to you that we did have some hot leads, but I mean... Cuando vosotros os enteráis de eso, de que la policía ha descubierto sangre en el apartamento, ¿cómo reaccionáis? You know what? This is all investigation. In the next film, we will be looking at more contradictions and also the evidence of two sniffer dogs.
Welcome, I'm Richard D. Hall and I'm here in Portugal, Praia de Luz. Now the reason why I've come here is because I'm making a series of documentaries about the Madeleine McCann case. Why am I making programs about that? Well, it's because I'm sick and tired of misleading media headlines about the incident. In these films, I will expose the hard facts about the incident and also what has happened since the incident. The documentaries clearly show the last place to get truthful information from is mainstream media and I will also expose those who are controlling mainstream media. I said we would look at changes in the McCann's initial story. Now I'll move on to look at just one of the many contradictions in the McCann's account of events. Again, it concerns the first day, the 3rd of May 2007, and it's a hugely significant contradiction because it concerns the last time that Madeline was seen alive by anyone other than the McCann's. The McCann's story is that they put the children to bed between about 7pm and 8pm that night. Then, the children all asleep, as they claim, they cracked open a beer and some wine before wandering down to the tapas restaurant at about 8.30pm to dine with their friends. The rest of the evening's events were set down by one of the McCann's friends, Russell O'Brien, on a timeline. Soon afterwards he produced a second one, slightly different. Bizarrely, these timelines were written up on the ripped-off back page of a Sainsbury's activity sticker book belonging to Madeline, which the McCann's had handed to Russell O'Brien. It seems incomprehensible that they should treat their precious daughter's sticker book so lightly. But what we are going to do now is examine an event that is said to have taken place just before the McCanns put the children to bed. One of their closest friends, Dr. David Payne, claims to have seen Madeline and the other two children during the half hour before then, 6.30pm to 7pm. This event, if it happened, is hugely significant. For the McCanns, it would prove that Madeline was alive during this half-hour period. The McCanns admit that they were the last people to see Madeline alive. But if there was any doubt about Madeline being alive that early evening, then a clear statement by their doctor friend that she was alive between 6.30pm and 7pm would undoubtedly help them. And indeed, right on cue, just after the McCanns were made suspects, David James Smith in the Times on the 9th of September wrote, on the evening of May the 3rd, the last moment when Madeline was definitely seen alive by anybody other than the McCanns was about 7pm as the group put their children to bed. That reference was to the McCanns' long-term close friend, Dr. David Payne. A significant article appeared in mainstream media on the 22nd of September 2007. The Daily Mail ran a major article, McCanns, What Really Happened in Madeline's Missing Six Hours?, by their correspondents Sam Greenhill and Paul Harris, based in Praia de Luz, and Dan Newling. Leaks had emerged from the Portuguese police that there were major gaps in the McCann's accounts of what happened during the afternoon and early evening of the 3rd of May, the day Madeline was reported missing. The print media ran stories about the missing six hours. The Mail claimed it was the first full account of Kate and Jerry McCann's final day with their daughter, a poignant chronology of a summer day that turned to tragedy and grief. That claim was not true. It was neither a full account nor an accurate account. For a start, this so-called full account completely omitted any reference to Dr. Payne's alleged visit to the McCann's apartment said to have taken place between 5.50pm and 6pm that evening. The Mail's account said, The McCann's played tennis in the afternoon while Madeline went back to the creche. Madeline had high tea at 5.30pm with staff at the kids' club. She was picked up shortly before 6pm by Kate and Jerry. After that, Kate and Jerry went home, got the kids ready for bed and got ready to go out for their meal. That account is significant. It does not mention any visit by David Payne to the McCann's apartment. It does not say anything about Jerry McCann playing tennis at 6.30pm, as claimed elsewhere. The Mail article gives the impression that the McCann family went home at 6, put the kids to bed, got ready to go out and then went out to dinner, which they say was about 8.30pm. If we also bring in the evidence of Fiona Payne, David Payne's wife, even more contradictions come to light. 
She maintains that she went to the McCann's apartment at 7pm and that her husband, Dr David Payne, joined her there 10 minutes later. There's no mention of this elsewhere. And besides that, Dr Payne is adamant in his statements that his wife was not at the apartment and moreover that he was playing tennis after 7pm until 8pm. Another Tapas 7 member, Dr Matthew Oldfield, likewise says that he, Russell O'Brien and David Payne were all playing tennis from 6pm to 7pm, completely undermining Dr Payne's statement about his alleged visit to Kate. Even more bewildering, he says that at that time, Jerry, Kate and all three children were at the tennis court, with Kate and the three children watching Jerry. This contradicts the McCann's claim that all of them walked back to their flat 20 minutes earlier. So let's begin our analysis of this claimed event with Dr. Payne's actual statements. He was first interviewed by the Portuguese police at 11.45 a.m. on Friday the 4th of May, the day after Madeline was reported missing. This is all he says on that occasion. Concerning yesterday evening, he states that he, his wife and his mother-in-law arrived at the restaurant at around 8.55 p.m. According to what he remembers, when they arrived, all the members of the group were present apart from the children who were in bed. During the evening, Jerry, Jane and Matthew went alternately to their children's bedrooms to check if they were sleeping. He thinks they physically went to the apartments. He no longer remembers in what order they went to see their children. So nothing whatsoever about seeing Madeline alive between 6.30pm and 7pm. It appears that David Payne may subsequently have made at least one, if not two or more, written statements to the police and been interviewed by Leicestershire Police. None of these statements are anywhere to be found in the documents released in 2008 by the Portuguese police. The following crucial email was sent on the 24th of October 2007 by Detective Constable Mike Marshall of Leicestershire Police to Ricardo Paiva of the Portuguese police. It reads, Ricardo, as requested, appended are the statements of Arul and Catharina Gaspar. I read carefully the written statements by David Payne, but was not able to extract any other information besides what is already known. He declares that he saw Madeline for the last time at 1700 hours on the 3rd of the 5th or 7 in the McCann's apartment. Also present were Kate and Jerry. He did not indicate the motive for being there or what he was doing. Similarly, he does not indicate for how long he stayed. When asked with whom he was on the afternoon of the 3rd of May, he declares that this information was already offered to the police and he cannot remember if anyone else was there. He does not remember what he was wearing that afternoon. So some very interesting statements here, from one police force to another. We'll see the significance of them as we probe this alleged visit further. Payne has told the police, 1. He saw Madeline at around 5pm. 2. Both Kate and Jerry were present when he saw Madeline. He completely changed that in later statements when he said it was at 6.30 and that Jerry was not there. In a very plain statement, D.C. Marshall also tells us that Payne didn't know why he had gone there, he had no idea what he was doing there, and he has no idea how long he stayed. Nearly a year after Madeline's disappearance, however, Dr. Payne was again interviewed by Leicestershire Police. They carried out what is known as a rogatory interview. It was carried out by British police officers following what are called rogatory letters sent to the Home Office asking the British police to interrogate witnesses. Detective Constable Messiah carried out the interview at Leicestershire Police Headquarters, Enderby, on the 11th of April 2008. It began at 10.26am. It begins with him describing meeting up with some of his friends for what he describes as an evening meal at the Paraiso restaurant. We know from a CCTV recording that this occurred around 5.30pm to 6pm. Here is the relevant passage of his statement. It's taken directly from the police transcript of this interview. Uh, I was down uh, windsurfing. I must have been windsurfing for a couple of hours. Uh, saw Matt and Russ out on uh, the catamaran. And after we finished there, we, you know, we met on the beach. Uh, played with the girls on the beach. And then we went to the uh, restaurant which is on the uh, overlooking the beach and you know we had uh, the evening meal there. Uh, after we had the meal we got some ice cream and then uh, we decided that we were going to go up and play tennis. So I left uh, with uh, Russell, we left the, uh, the girls at the restaurant and we went up to the, uh, back up to the Ocean Club. Uh, as I say I'm not sure you know what happened to Matt and Russell at that particular moment 
But I remember then, you know, I went over to see uh, Jerry at the, uh, you know, tennis courts just to see, you know, what was happening and uh, decided that we'd, you know, I'd come back to play tennis and uh, Jerry had asked me just to pop in and check everything was all right uh, with Kate or, you know, again, I can't remember the exact reason whether he was just making sure it was all right that he could stay there and, you know, more time, but, you know, he'd asked me to pop in. So I walked back uh, from the tennis courts uh, back to, uh, you know, Kate and Jerry's apartment and the time, you know, looking at, you know, we've looked obviously at photographs since then. And, you know, the time that we've got that I was, you know, going to Kate's about 6.30. Uh, and I went into their apartment through the patio doors. The three children were all, you know, dressed, you know, in their pyjamas. You know, they looked immaculate. You know, they were just like angels. They all looked so happy and well looked after and content. And I said to Kate, it's a bit early for the, you know, for the three of them to go to bed. She said, ah, they've had such a great time. They're just, they're really tired and, you know, uh, so to say, you know, I can't remember exactly what, you know, the night attire, what the children were wearing, but white was the predominant uh, colour. But, you know, just to reinforce, they were just so happy seeing, you know, obviously Jerry wasn't there, but they were just all just so at peace. And, you know, they looked like a family who'd had such a fantastic time. And, uh, yeah, then I left there, went and got my stuff, went back to the tennis courts and then... Uh, it was me, Matt, Russell, and I think Jerry played for a little while, but he decided that he'd, he'd played enough tennis for that day and uh, was going back. And so it left with me, Russell, and uh, Matt, and uh, Dan, who was the you know tennis coach for Mark Warner. The statement is extremely hesitant. It does not flow as it would if someone was telling the truth. He gives every appearance of thinking very hard about every statement before he makes it. Whilst many of us routinely use erms and ers as we speak, sometimes to give us a short space for thinking, this short passage is remarkable for including 30 ers and 27 you knows. We also have a number of statements of doubt, I think, not sure, and can't remember. But let's look at the main things he says. These are, 1. He meets Jerry McCann at the tennis courts. 2. Jerry McCann asks him to see Kate. He can't actually remember why. 3. It was about 6.30pm. 4. He walked through the patio doors. 5. The three children were all in their pyjamas ready for bed. They were mostly white in colour. 6. Kate and the children all looked very happy. 7. He went back to the tennis courts. 8. He played with Jerry for a short while and then Jerry stopped playing as he'd played enough tennis that day. The police officer then probes him about how he met Jerry at the tennis courts and about Jerry asking him to see Kate. Payne now becomes even more hesitant. And what was Jerry doing? Uh, Jerry had been, you know, playing, you know, tennis already. He was having a good uh, game, and I think there was, you know, and there were a couple of the other tennis players who had specifically gone there on the Mark Warner holiday to play tennis, and, you know, Jerry was, you know, getting a lot out of the week from the tennis and made friends with those people, and he was having a good time with them. Uh, so, you know, he would basically be playing tennis. Yeah, and at what point did you have the conversation with him? Did he stop the game, or did you speak to him whilst he was playing? I can't remember. I can't remember. I, you know, in my mind, you know, he stopped playing, and, you know, but I can't remember, if I'm perfectly honest. And how long did you stay and watch the game for? Uh, all I remember is I was having a, you know, a brief conversation with Jerry, uh, you know, and then, you know, I went back. I didn't actually stay there for too long because of the time, you know, it was ticking by. Uh, but again, these are, you know... As we can see, he cannot remember exactly how this supposed conversation with Jerry McCann actually occurred, nor does he say who was actually playing tennis with Jerry at this time. The police officer presses him about the moment when Jerry is supposed to have asked Payne to go and see Kate. OK, and it was at what point that Jerry said to you, go, and would you mind checking on Kate? Well, I mean, coming back from the beach, I'd got no equipment to play tennis, you know, etc. So I had to go back to my room to, you know, change into my stuff appropriate for playing tennis in. And uh, so he knew I'd walk up that by and past. So he said, oh, why don't you, uh, you know, you can just pop in on the way. So it was on the way back from me picking the stuff up. Right, so you've walked past. You've walked past Jerry's apartment to get to yours. Mm -hmm. Got changed. In my mind, it was on the way up that I'd popped into Kate, but it could have been on the way back again. I'm sorry. No, it's okay. For my vagueness. But either way, you'd have to walk past because you go the roadside, don't you? Yeah. 
So you'd have to walk past Jerry's? Yeah. Front door twice, wouldn't you? Yeah. Is that right? So the reason why I think it was more likely that I did it on the way there was because I've called in through the uh, patio. It kind of made more sense that I'd have walked in through the gate and then up through the, you know, where the sliding doors are to say I'm here rather than going to my apartment, coming back down, coming past the apartment and then coming in the sliding doors. Yeah. Because what I would have done is I'd have got changed and gone downstairs and then knocked on the front door because that, you know, that would have made more sense rather than going all the way around and, yeah, of course. So that's in my mind why it makes more sense that that was on the way up. Analyzing this, he is extraordinarily vague about the sequence of events, but he ends up saying that after speaking to Jerry, he went up the flight of steps to the McCann's apartment, then walked through the open patio doors to see Kate and the children, then left, walked on past the front door of the McCann's apartment, got changed into his tennis gear, then walked back past the McCann's front door again and back to the tennis court, where Jerry was still playing. Then there is a passage where the police officer asks Payne to remember precisely what happened when he went to the McCann's apartment. This is how the interview goes. I just want to revisit the going and seeing Kate before we move on. All right, the reason why I've kept it separate is because I want you to just think now. Mm -hmm. And imagine, remember what you saw. Mm -hmm. Did you open the door, sliding door, or was it already open? Or, uh, I think it was already open. Uh, you know, as I say, I walked up there, Kate was, you know, I say, looking very relaxed, and uh, I say a comment to her, and I said, well, crikey, it's early, early for them to be getting ready, you know, for bed. As I say, she said, ah, no, I've had such a good, you know, such a good day and afternoon, uh, so, you know, and Jerry's just obviously finishing off playing tennis, and uh, so, you know, hopefully try and get them down. And as I say, we were just, you know, I know it does sound bizarre, but I just looked at the three of them and I couldn't, you know, they were just so well presented and so clean and immaculate. It was, you know, I was, and, you know, they just looked such healthy children. Uh, you know, there's, you know, nothing that normally, yeah, triggers in my mind like that, but it was just how well that they looked. And uh, try to remember where they were in the apartment. The time that I was there, uh, you know, all... All of them, uh, all the children and Kate were in the, uh, as soon as you go through the patio doors, uh, you know, they were all in the immediate area, you know, in front of you. Uh, that was the area that they generally, you know, when I saw them, you know, I didn't go any further into the apartment. You know, it was just a conversation that I like, you know, walked into the, you know, through the French doors. I went into the lounge, uh, you know, the open plan area and, uh, you know, just had a brief conversation. You know, things started off by, as I say, saying about the, how well they looked and you know it's early to get them ready for bed and then I said oh Jerry's you know just finished over there we're going over to play a bit of tennis uh, I probably said is there any problems with that and she said uh, no no fine you know carry on and uh, you know perhaps a bit more of conversation uh, but it wasn't many minutes that I was there yeah but uh, certainly enough time just to see you know certainly the apartment there was nothing that was untoward that was, you know, uh, the children all looked extremely happy and there was no, you know, signs of any problems with, uh, you know, Kate, you know, or indeed the relationship that Kate had got with any of the three children. None of the children had been told off. None of the children looked like, you know, they were in trouble for anything. You know, they were uh, still all talking and playing around. Uh, so, you know, it was just a very uh, transient, you know, that I'd gone in there. But as I say, it just struck me how well they all looked. Yeah. And content, I suppose, is the other word to use. Did you actually go into the apartment? I did. Or did you do the conversation from the door? No, definitely was inside the apartment. You know, whether it be two or three steps into the apartment or, you know, however many. I was definitely in the apartment. Okay, so now what I'm going to ask you to try and recollect what everybody was wearing. I'm afraid that is, you know, I'm, I cannot recall at all. You'd think that would be an obvious thing to remember. I cannot remember. From the children point of view predominantly I can remember the you know white but I couldn't say exactly what they were wearing uh, but could you remember what Kate was wearing for example I can't know and did you actually set eyes on each individual child all three children I saw yeah and were they standing up sitting down uh, they were generally standing up yeah did they actually acknowledge you uh, oh yeah you know I'm very sure that if you'd have asked them you know that evening or the next day They'd all say, uh, yeah, I popped in. You know, I, you know, I did know the children very well. 
we'd all, you know, met up many times before. Uh, you know, I, you know, again, I'd be playing with Madeline, you know, in the uh, in the play area, uh, you know, during that week, you know, lifting her up, twizzing her around and everything. I knew her that well, you know, to do that. And as I say, uh, she definitely knew who I was. And certainly, as I say, just to reinforce, she looked very happy. Yeah, was that the last time you saw Madeline? It was. How many minutes? You said as a matter of minutes, and then you went back, and then you played tennis. Mm -hmm. I'm going to pin you down and ask you how long you think you were in there for. I know you say minutes. In the apartment, it's, it, I'd say three minutes, five maximum. Three to five. Yeah. So then you step back out. Did you leave the doors open, or did you close them? Uh, I couldn't remember. You know, again, I've got the in my mind that the patio doors were open when I went in, and I probably would have just walked out back that way. You know, it's still, I mean, it's still relatively nice outside. It was light and everything, so, uh, you know, I, whether they kept the door open, it's just nice when it's in the end of the evening, you know, sorry, you know, the end of the afternoon. But if I'm perfectly honest, the answer to that question is, I can't remember. Okay, so when you went back and then you played, you played a game for about an hour. Once again, he gives extraordinarily long, rambling answers to the simplest of questions, such as, where were the children in the apartment, and did they acknowledge you? Again, there are excessive errs, 35, and a remarkable 56 you knows in that short section of the interview, plus many as I says and I means. To a number of questions, he answers, I can't remember, or I can't recall. But we're now going to compare Payne's account of this alleged event with what Kate said on the record about it, just to remind ourselves, Payne has made these factual issues pretty clear. He entered via the patio door, it was probably open, he went into the apartment, he saw Kate and the three children, he stayed for three to five minutes. So what is Kate's version of this encounter? When interviewed on the 4th of May, the day after Madeline's reported disappearance, she says this about the time between 5pm and 8.30pm. Around 5 to 5.30 p.m., the children ate at a bar under the watchful eyes of the parents. After the 5 p.m. dinner, they bathed the children, prepared them for the night, and let them play for a while at a playground next to the tennis courts, still and always under parental supervision. At around 8 p.m., the children were put to bed until the following morning, when the described routine started all over again. So at this stage, there is no mention at all of the supposed visit of David Payne to her apartment, but Jerry does refer to it in a statement he made to the Portuguese police on the 10th of May. During the afternoon of that day, the rest of the group, including the children, were at the beach, having returned at 18.30 hours, the time at which he saw David Payne next to the tennis court. David went to visit Kate and the children and returned close to 7 o'clock, trying to convince the deponent to continue to play tennis, which he refused, as he had already been playing for about an hour and had to go back to his wife. Nevertheless, Russell, David and Matthew stayed to play. He doesn't explain why David Payne went to visit Kate. He says David Payne left the tennis court at 6.30pm and returned a full half an hour later. Kate doesn't make another statement to the Portuguese police until the 6th of September. Here is what she said on that occasion. While the children were eating and looking at some books, Kate had a shower which lasted around five minutes. After showering at around 6.30 to 6.40, and while she was getting dry, she heard somebody knocking at the balcony door. She wrapped herself in a towel and went to see who was at the balcony door. This door was closed but not locked, as Jerry had left through this door. She saw that it was David Payne because he called out and had opened the door slightly. David's visit was to help her to take the children to the recreation area. When David returned from the beach, he was with Jerry at the tennis courts, and it was Jerry who asked him to help Kate with taking the children to the recreation area, which had been arranged but did not take place. David was at the apartment for around 30 seconds. He didn't even actually enter the flat. He remained at the balcony door. According to her, he then left for the tennis courts where Jerry was. The time was around 6.30 to 6.40 p.m. After David left, Kate dressed and sat with the children, Madeline on her lap. So let's look at the contradictions between the two accounts. Payne says he walked through the patio door which was open. Kate says that the door was closed, but Payne had opened it slightly. Payne says that he walked in without knocking. Kate says she heard someone knocking at the patio door. Payne says that Kate was dressed. Kate says she had just come out of the shower and only had a towel around her. Payne says he entered the apartment. Kate says he did not. 
and that he remained at the balcony door. Payne says he was in the apartment for three to five minutes. Kate says he was not in the apartment but at the apartment and only for 30 seconds. Payne says he saw all three children. Kate doesn't mention this. That's six significant differences altogether. Add to that David Payne's obvious hesitancy and evasiveness and his apparent difficulty in answering a straight question and remembering. Then put into the mix the fact that when questioned on the 4th of May, neither Payne nor Kate McCann mentioned this alleged visit. A suspicion clearly arises that this visit may never have happened and could have been fabricated in an attempt to prove that Madeline was alive at 6.30pm that day. But quite apart from the doubts we have already examined, there is one other aspect of this alleged event that we need to analyse, and that's the stated reasons by all concerned about why David Payne is supposed to have visited Kate and the children. Let's begin with the statement that Jerry McCann gave to the police when he was made a suspect. Regarding the episode where he spoke to David on the 3rd of May, he says that he was playing tennis at 18.30, when David appeared near the tennis court and asked him through the fence if he was going to continue playing. The deponent said he didn't know because Kate might be needing help to look after the three children, even more so because they intended to bring them to the recreation area after their showers. He thinks that David offered to check if Kate needed help, which he did, and returned minutes later. Concerning his previous statement where he states that David returned half an hour later at around 7 o'clock, he says that he returned to the tennis courts after half an hour, as this time frame refers to the second time he returned to the tennis court after dressing up for the game. So, interpreting what is being said here by Jerry, the conversation must have gone very much like this. Payne, are you carrying on playing? Jerry, I'm not sure. Kate might be needing some help. We're going to bring the children down after their showers to watch. Payne, OK then, I'll go and check. Before going on to look at what others have said about this alleged conversation between Jerry and Payne, there's yet another contradiction we need to note. On the 10th of May, Jerry had told police quite clearly that Payne had been gone for half an hour, 6.30pm to 7pm. Now he changes his story. This time he tries to say that Payne came back twice. He says that Payne came back a second time, quote, after dressing up for the game. But as we saw above, that's emphatically not what Payne says. He quite clearly explained that he was going from the tennis court to get changed. He says he can't remember if he called on Kate on the way to getting changed or on the way back. He decided it was on the way there that he must have called on Kate. So this is Payne's account of events. He left the tennis court, called at Kate's, went to his apartment to change, and then returned to play tennis. In other words, he returned once, not twice as Jerry now claims. The two accounts can't be reconciled. Before we leave this topic, even more contradictions arise when we examine what reasons have been given for Payne visiting Kate. The issue of this alleged visit of Payne to Kate McCann first arose in September 2007, four months after Madeline's disappearance, when sections of the British press began referring to the missing six hours, a gap in the afternoon and early evening when it was unclear what the McCanns and their friends were doing. The McCann team responded quickly by making various statements about this alleged visit of Dr. David Payne. Neither Kate nor Jerry McCann mentioned the alleged Payne visit in their first statements on the 4th of May, but Jerry McCann did in his second police statement on the 10th of May. He simply said that David Payne went to visit Kate at 6.30pm, returned at 7pm to the tennis court and tried to convince Jerry to carry on playing tennis. Jerry says in his initial statement, I'd been playing for about an hour. I had to go back to my wife. So Jerry tells us nothing about the purpose of this visit, just that Payne went to visit Kate. Kate McCann was interviewed by the Portuguese police on the 6th of September. This was the interview just before the later one, where she was shown videos of the cadaver dogs alerting. At that interview, she exercised her right to remain silent. But on the 6th of September 2007, she answered questions, and this is what she told the Portuguese police. While the children were eating and looking at some books, I had a shower which lasted around five minutes. After showering at around 6.30 to 6.40 p.m., and while she was getting dry, she heard somebody knocking at the balcony door. She wrapped herself in a towel and went to see who was at the balcony door. 
This door was closed but not locked as Jerry had left through this door. She saw that it was David Payne because he called out and had opened the door slightly. David's visit was to help her to take the children to the recreation area. When David returned from the beach, he was with Jerry at the tennis courts. Jerry asked him to help me taking the children to the recreation area, which had been arranged. But this did not take place. David was at the apartment for around 30 seconds. He didn't actually enter the flat. He remained at the balcony door. He then left for the tennis courts. That's different from what Payne had told Leicestershire Police. He had said, I can't remember the exact reason, whether he was just making sure it was all right that he could stay there. In other words, according to Payne, Jerry is supposed to have asked him to go up to his flat and ask Kate, is it okay if Jerry stays down at the courts? The first report in the media about Dr. Payne's alleged visit to the McCann's apartment said this, it is reported that Mr. Payne was playing in a tennis competition which included Jerry on the early evening of the 3rd of May. It is alleged that when he had been eliminated from the competition, Jerry asked him to pop into their apartment and check on Kate. Reports state that Mr. Payne saw Madeline being put to bed by Kate at 6.30pm. If true, this would make David Payne the last independent witness to see Madeline before her disappearance. Here then, a third different reason is given for Dr. Payne's visit. This time it is to check on Kate, not to help take the children to the recreation area, nor to see if Kate would allow Jerry to carry on playing tennis. But now notice even more contradictions. It is claimed here that Jerry was eliminated from the competition. In his various statements to the police, he says nothing about a competition, certainly nothing about being eliminated from anything. On the 16th of December 2007, David James Smith wrote a pompous article about the McCann case, boasting of how he had got the inside story on what really happened to Madeline from Jerry McCann himself. He wrote, Jerry had knocked up at the start of the 4.30pm tennis drill session, but had decided not to exacerbate an injury to his Achilles tendon, so had dropped out and waded around by the courts. What do we believe? that at 4.30pm he was too injured to play tennis, or that at 6.30pm, two hours later, he was merrily playing away in a tennis competition. Quite probably, neither statement is true. Now let's look at another point about this particular statement in the mainstream media. Reports state that Dr. Payne saw Madeline being put to bed. Saw her being put to bed. Dr. Payne doesn't say that. Kate McCann doesn't say that. Yet there it is in black and white in the mainstream print media. Who put it there? Was it once again the man who claimed he once controlled what comes out in the media, Clarence Mitchell? In her statement to the Portuguese police on the 6th of September, Kate McCann had also said that Jerry and Kate both arrived back at the flat at 5.40pm. They both bathed the children because they were tired and needed to go to bed. Jerry went down to play tennis at 6pm. They decided the children were too tired to go down to the recreation area. So if that were true, then clearly any claims that Dr. Payne went up to the flat to see if Kate and the children were coming down were utter nonsense, false in fact. We saw earlier how on the 10th of May, Jerry McCann had referred to a visit by Dr. Payne to see Kate between 6.30pm and 7pm, apparently half an hour long. He had claimed in that statement that on returning from his wife, Payne had asked him to carry on playing tennis, but he had refused. But when interviewed by the police again on the 7th of September, Jerry McCann gave an altogether different reason for Payne's alleged visit. He now told police, I was playing tennis at 6.30pm when David appeared near the tennis court and asked me through the net if I was going to continue playing. I said I didn't know because Kate might be needing help to look after the three children even more so because we intended to bring them to the recreation area after their showers. He thinks that David offered to check if Kate needed help, which he did, and returned minutes later. He goes on to explain to the police why he first of all said that Payne was away seeing his wife for 30 minutes, but now was saying that the visit only lasted a few minutes. As we saw just now, he gets out of this by telling the police that David Payne returned twice, and the first time without his tennis gear, the second time with his tennis gear on. So if Dr. Payne really did visit Kate McCann around 6.30pm on the night Madeline disappeared, for which of the following reasons was it? 
All these have at various times been given by various witnesses. A. Just for a visit. B. To bring her and the children down to the recreation area. C. To check on Kate to see if she was all right. D. Kate might be needing help to look after the children. E. To see if it was okay for Jerry to carry on playing tennis. Or F. Because Dr. Payne offered to go. So let's now round up our review of this alleged visit of Dr. Payne and his claim of seeing all three children. We examined six key contradictions about the claimed visit. Let's call those contradictions one to six. We've seen another list of contradictions about the supposed reasons for the visit. Let's call those contradictions seven to twelve. But we've now seen a whole raft of other contradictions. Contradiction thirteen. When was the visit? Payne first of all said it was 5 p.m. Later that was changed to 6.30 p.m. His wife said he got there about 7.10 p.m. Contradiction 14. Was he there at all? Both Fiona Payne and Matthew Oldfield say he was on the tennis courts between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m. Contradiction 15. Statements were made to the media saying that Payne saw the children being put to bed. Neither Payne nor Kate McCann mentioned this. Contradiction 16. The McCanns say they took the children up to their apartment at 5.40pm and stayed there. Matthew Oldfield maintains they were all on the tennis court at 6pm, 20 minutes later. Contradiction 17. Jerry McCann maintains he was at the tennis courts at 6.30pm, when elsewhere reports say that he and his family were quietly putting the children to bed at that time. Contradiction 18. Payne first of all said that both Jerry and Kate were there when he visited the apartment, Later, he changed this to saying it was just Kate. Contradiction 19. Payne says he returned once to the tennis court. Jerry McCann says it was twice. Contradiction 20. Jerry McCann was too injured with an Achilles tendon injury at 4.30pm to carry on playing. An hour and a half later, he was apparently able to carry on playing in a competition. We have examined just one alleged incident in great detail and revealed 20 separate contradictions. That's because it's so important. The last time someone other than the McCanns is supposed to have seen them. The accounts of this alleged visit differ so comprehensively that I suspect most of you will probably agree with me that this visit didn't happen. And if so, what implications does that have for the rest of what the McCanns say about Madeline's disappearance? If we had the time, we could have exposed so many other changes of story and contradictions in depth. Here's a whole lot more that we could have gone into in the same way. Different accounts of whether both parents were with Madeline at tea time on the 3rd of May. Changes of story by Dr. Matthew Oldfield about what he did and what he saw on his alleged check on the children at 9.30pm on the 3rd of May. The McCann's friend Jane Tanner claiming she saw a man carrying a child away from near the McCann's apartment. Then later the McCann spokesman saying she might have seen a woman. Jane Tanner saying she walked right past Jerry McCann and another holiday maker, Jez Wilkins. Neither of them saw her. The puzzle of why a photograph of Madeline, said to have been taken by Kate McCann on the last day of their holiday, was not produced for three weeks. Conflicting statements by the McCanns about whether the twins slept in beds or cots the night they reported Madeline missing. Whether the McCanns called their daughter Maddie or Madeline. There are dozens of them. At the end of the last film, I'll refer you to books, leaflets, websites, forums and blogs where you can get more information. Before leaving the subject of David Payne's alleged visit to Kate McCann at 6.30pm on the evening Madeline was reported missing, we need to mention another issue which once again the mainstream media have avoided despite the fact it is clearly part of the evidence in this case. This evidence comes from two respected general practitioners, Dr Catherine Gasper and her husband Dr Savio Gasper. They had previously been on holiday with the McCanns. As soon as the news of Madeline's apparent abduction became headline news on Friday the 4th of May, the Gaspers were concerned. Their thoughts turned to two unseemly incidents 
that had occurred whilst they were quaffing wine at their holiday villa alongside the McCanns and Dr. David Payne and his wife. Let's go straight to their witness evidence and see what they told Leicestershire Police on the 16th of May 2007, just 13 days after Madeleine McCann had been reported missing. My husband Savio and I are general practitioners. My husband knows Kate as they both attended Dundee University between 1987 and 1992. We got to be close friends of Jerry and Kate. In 2002 or 2003, Savio and I spent a weekend with Jerry and Kate in Devon. In September 2005, me and our first child, aged 18 months, holidayed in Mallorca with Kate, Jerry, Madeline and their twins, Sean and Emily, who were only a few months old. There were also other friends of Kate and Jerry there, including Dr David Payne and his wife. They had a daughter around one year old. Dr Payne organised the trip. Probably around the fourth or fifth day there was an incident that stuck in my mind. I have thought about this incident many times since then. One night when all the adults were sitting around on a patio outside the house where we were all staying, we had been eating and drinking berbers. I sat between Jerry McCann and David and I think both were talking about Madeline. I remember Dave saying to Jerry something about she, meaning Madeline, would do this. While he mentioned the word this, Dave was doing the action of sucking one of his fingers, pushing it in and out of his mouth, while with his other hand he was doing a circle around his nipple with a circular movement around his clothes. This was done in a provocative way. There seemed to be an explicit insinuation about what he was saying and doing. I remember being shocked by that. I always felt it was something very weird and that it was not something anyone would say or do. I looked at Jerry and also at Dave to gauge their reactions. I looked around as if saying, did someone else hear that or was it just me? The conversation stopped for a moment, then we all began conversing again. Moreover, I remember Dave doing the same thing on another occasion, again it was during a conversation in which he was talking about an imaginary scenario, although I'm not sure. He again stuck one of his fingers in and out of his mouth and with the other hand he once again drew a circle around his nipple in a provocative and sexual way. I think he was referring to the way she, his daughter Lily, would behave or what she would do. I remember thinking whether he would look at my daughter and other little girls in a different way than I or others do. I imagined that he had perhaps visited internet sites related to little children. In a word, I thought that he could be interested in child pornography on the web. During our holiday in Mallorca, each parent would bathe the children in turn. I was keen to stay near the bathroom if Dave was bathing the children, and told Savio to be careful and to be close by if Dave was helping to bathe the children, and my daughter in particular. During our stay in Mallorca, Dave and his wife Fiona and their daughter Lily used to take Madeline with them for the day in order that Kate and Jerry could rest a bit and have time just for the twins. The first time I heard the terrible news regarding Madeline on the radio, my thoughts raced immediately to Dave. I asked Savio if Dave was also on holiday with the McCanns in Portugal. He didn't know. I watched TV to catch the coverage and eventually discovered that Dave was there with the McCanns. As soon as she realised that Dr Payne had been in Portugal with the McCanns, she and her husband contacted Leicestershire Police. On the 16th of May they gave this important statement to Detective Constable Brewer of Leicestershire Police. And then we come on to one of the most extraordinary aspects of this case. This statement was suppressed by Leicestershire Police for five months. This vital piece of evidence was not sent to Portugal Police until mid-October. It was only sent to them a few days after the Portuguese police had removed Conchola Amaral from the investigation into Madeleine's disappearance. I'm sure I'm not alone in wondering why senior police officers in Leicestershire would suppress a report that contained the credible evidence from two respected doctors that someone who was with the McCanns in Portugal appeared to have an interest in child sexual abuse. It's time now for us to have a close look at what is, arguably, the main line of forensic evidence in this case, and one that has caused a huge amount of controversy, namely the evidence of two cadaver dogs brought to Portugal by one of the world's most sought-after sniffer dog handlers, British dog handler Martin Grime. In early August 2007, he brought his two dogs to Portugal. One of them, Eddie, was trained to alert to the order of human corpses, and the other, 
tequila to blood. As we shall see in detail, Martin Grime told Portuguese police officers that Eddie had detected the scent of death in no fewer than 11 locations associated with the McCanns, while Keeler also detected the scent of blood in three of those very same locations. The dogs were deployed on different days, so they alerted to these locations independently of each other. What I've first noticed is that as soon as I came in, um, the, the dog's uh, very excited um, and as a handler I can pick up his um, body language etc and it would appear to me that as soon as he's come in the, in the house um, he's picked up a scent that he recognises. there isn't a scent source in here, i.e. Um, a physical article where the scent is emitting from, any scent residue will um, collect in a particular place due to the air movement of the flat, of the, the apartment. Um, and what I would say in this case is that there's enough scent in that area there for him to give me um, a bark indication. Um, but the source may not be in that cupboard. The source may well be in this room somewhere else but the air is actually pushing it into that corner. Um, but it's, it's a strong indication um, and um, I, would, I would say it's positive for um, the things that he's trained to find. And he's decided yes that's what I'm looking for and that's when he's given me the bark indication. Um, what we should understand with this dog is that he only barks when he finds something. He won't bark at any other time. Um, the, the only uh, times I've ever known him bark since I, I got him as a small puppy was uh, A for his dinner um, and that's just excitement and, and that's one of the um, training methods we used to teach him to bark when we wanted him to and when he actually finds something. He won't bark at other dogs, he won't bark at strangers, he won't bark when somebody knocks on the door or, or anything like that. Um, so again I would say that's a positive indication. Okay, so. Let there be no doubt about what Martin Grimes said his dogs were alerted to. He said, in effect, that his dogs were alerting to the past presence of a human corpse in those 11 locations. As we shall see in a moment, no other corpses had been present in those 11 locations. Therefore, if a corpse really had been in contact with those 11 locations, it could only have been that of Madeleine McCann. But it's necessary also to point out that in his report, Martin Grime acknowledged that the evidence of his dogs alone was not sufficient to prove that a corpse had been in those locations. He said that there would need to be corroboration in the form, for example, of forensic evidence or the kind of circumstantial evidence we discussed earlier. He pointed out correctly that, quote, Whereas there may be no retrievable evidence for court purposes, these alerts may well assist intelligence gathering in major crime investigations. The dog's alerts alone then could not convict anyone of either killing Madeline or hiding her body. There would need to be other evidence. And a little bit later, we'll have a detailed look at how the McCanns themselves explained the alerts of Martin Grimes' two dogs. So first of all, who sent the dogs to Portugal? It was actually a combined operation by the Portuguese and British police. By July, two months into the investigations into Madeleine's disappearance, the team of detectives, led by Dr. Conchalo Amaral, had clearly formed the view that the McCanns and their friends were not telling the truth and were hiding something. They and top British police actively worked on the theory that Madeleine had in fact died in the McCanns' holiday apartment and that the McCanns, perhaps with the help of others, had hidden or disposed of her body. One top British police officer whose opinion was sought was Lee Rainbow who was then Britain's top criminal profiler, employed by the National Police Intelligence Service. He in turn consulted Mark Harrison, who recommended that Martin Grime and his dogs be brought in to search for evidence of past presence of a corpse and of blood in the holiday apartment rented by the McCanns, in the hired car they were using, and on their clothes, and on other personal items. And so Martin Grime was appointed. What were Martin Grimes' qualifications and experience for this task, which could determine the outcome of this whole investigation? By the time Grimes was assigned to this task in July 2007, 
he claimed that in over 200 trials, Eddie had never been wrong. If he gave an alert in every single case, a corpse had been in that very location. Eddie's track record included some impressive results. Since 2007, Martin Grime has been involved in several more successful investigations. An outstanding example was a case in the USA. The cadaver dog evidence provided by Martin Grime's sniffer dog showed that a suspect had carried a body in his car. Martin Grime has taken his sniffer dogs to help in investigations in several countries and his expertise was so valued by the FBI that he has now set up a business in the United States, largely funded by his work for the FBI. His credentials are therefore impeccable. Only twice has his expertise been questioned, once in the McCann case, the other occasion was when he took his cadaver dogs to the notorious Haute de la Garand Children's Home in Jersey, where children were abused for decades, and there were credible reports that some children had been killed by their abusers. It was a place the late Sir Jimmy Savile visited more than once. Eddie alerted to the scent of a corpse in the Haute de la Garand home. He was videoed at the home. Bones were found, and one bone in particular was thought to have been that of a child's skull. When it was tested in forensic laboratories, it was shown to have been made up with 1.6% collagen, this proving it was a human or animal skull. Yet the establishment, aided by the mainstream media, circulated a baseless rumour that the laboratory had said the exhibit was nothing more than a coconut. Some excellent work in exposing the Jersey Home child abuse scandal has been carried out by Stuart Sivret of the Jersey Parliament, which shows how the false story of Eddie allegedly alerting to a coconut was concocted. It is a subject we may return to again in another documentary. So let us now consider exactly what Eddie and Keeler found when Martin Grime took his dogs to the village of Praia de Luz in the first week of August 2007. I'll do so by quoting from a document that the McCanns themselves are very fond of relying on, and that's the final report of the regional Portuguese Attorney General Fernando José Pinto Monteiro in July 2008. Things were moving rapidly in the summer of 2008, as this extract from Wikipedia tells us. A judgment from Evora Supreme Court of Justice in Portimao was released on the 29th of May and revealed that Portuguese prosecutors were examining several charges including a. Abandonment of a child b. Abduction c. Homicide and d. Concealment of a corpse. Two months later, on the 21st of July 2008, the Portuguese Attorney General announced that there was no evidence to link the McCanns or Robert Murat to the disappearance that the case was closed and that the aguido or suspect status of all three had been lifted. On the 4th of August, the Ministerio Público, the Portuguese Ministry of Justice, released 11,233 pages of the case file to the media on CD-ROMs. This was the final report that recommended that the investigation into Madeleine's disappearance be shelved because there was insufficient evidence with which to charge any individual with being responsible for Madeleine's disappearance. The investigation was filed under the headings of crime, hiding a body or abduction, and the Portuguese police said they would only reinvestigate the matter if the Portuguese police received new and credible evidence that could lead to an arrest of the person or persons responsible. The release of 11,233 pages of witness statements, expert reports and evidential material to the public via a series of DVDs would never happen under British law. But in this unique case it has provided the raw material for a legion of amateur sleuths in many countries to work on. So here's what Fernando José Pinto Monteiro's report told us. Under Section D of its report, headed Dog Searches and the Constitution of Gerald McCann and Kate Healy as Arguidos, his report begins by noting that Mark Harrison, a national councillor from Britain for searches at the level of all police agencies in the United Kingdom concerning missing persons, abduction and homicide cases, had recommended that trained sniffer dogs be brought in which could, in his words, detect mortal victims by tracing very small samples of human remains bodily fluids and blood in any environment or terrain. The findings of the dogs were recorded as follows. 1. Eddie signalled cadaver odour inside the couple's bedroom in apartment 5A in an area next to the wardrobe. 2. 
Eddie signalled cadaver order in the same apartment in an area near the living room window, which has direct access to the street behind the sofa. 3. Eddie signalled cadaver order at the same apartment in the garden area, in a square corner vertically below the balcony. 4. Eddie signalled cadaver order in the Vista de Mar Villa, that is, the house that was rented by the McCanns after leaving the Ocean Club, in the area of a wardrobe that contained inside it the soft toy cuddle cat that belonged to Madeleine McCann. 5. Eddie signalled cadaver order on two items of clothing belonging to Kate McCann, which were examined in a pavilion in Lagos. 6. Eddie signalled cadaver order on the door of the Renault Scenic, registration 59DA27, by the lower outside area next to the driver's door. 7. Eddie signalled cadaver order on the key card of that vehicle when it was hidden under a fire prevention sandbox. Strangely, the Attorney General's report actually left out some of the alerts, clearly mentioned by Martin Grime in his report. As for Keeler, the bloodhound dog, the Attorney General said this. 1. Keeler, the dog that detects the presence of human blood, signalled an area in the living room in apartment 5A, which had already been signalled by Eddie. 2. Keeler, the dog that detects the presence of human blood, signalled the same area again as where Eddie had signalled, in the living room of the apartment. 3. Keeler, the dog that detects the presence of human blood, signalled the lower part of the left-hand side curtain of the window in the same living room. 4. Keeler, the dog that detects the presence of human blood, signalled the right lower lateral part of the inside of the boot of vehicle 59DA27. 5. Keeler, the dog that detects the presence of human blood, signalled the storage compartment on the driver's door which held the vehicle's key card. 6. Keeler, the dog that detects the presence of human blood, also signalled the car's key card when the same was hidden under the fire service sandbox inside the parking lot. The Attorney General added for good measure, The viewing of these videos, whose contents is very impressive, becomes essential to understand the dog's action and signalling more than by any words. We know from the book written by Portuguese detective Gonçalo Amaral that the report of Martin Grime on his dogs was dynamite. The Portuguese police had been doubtful of the McCann's version of events from day one. Their suspicions had led them to take advice from the British police. Top British police officers said it was reasonable to suspect that the parents had lied about what had happened to Madeline and may have covered up her death, whether it was accidental death or otherwise. Now they had what to them seemed concrete confirmation of their hypothesis. At around the same time, they had preliminary forensic results back from samples of blood and blood fluids found in the living room of the McCann's apartment and in the Renault Scenic that they hired. These first results showed that the samples matched the DNA from Madeline in 15 out of 19 indication, roughly, only a million to one chance that these samples were not from Madeline. The police had got powerful indications from the alerts of the two Springer Spaniels. The DNA results were heading in the same direction, as we shall see in more detail in a later programme. Now, however, we will examine in detail how the McCanns reacted to the alerts of the cadaver dogs. It was perhaps inevitable that with the world's eyes on the investigation team in Portugal, and with the police now having the results from Martin Grimes cadaver dogs, that at least one police officer would leak this dramatic news to the media. And so it came to pass. It was Monday the 6th of August, barely three months after Madeleine had been reported missing, that a Portuguese newspaper, Journal de Noticias, dramatically reported that British sniffer dogs had found traces of blood on a wall in the apartment where Madeleine went missing, below the window of the living room near the floor. The McCanns began to react two days later. A person described as a friend of the McCanns, Rachel Oldfield, one of the so-called Tapas Seven, was reported as saying she was disgusted at what appeared to be a deliberate smear campaign against them. She was quoted as saying, I think there are some leaks coming from the police because a lot of what I have read recently has been completely untrue. The following day the press referred to reports of an increasing backlash against the McCanns, both by Portuguese people and by fellow holidaymakers at the Ocean Club. The McCanns retorted that they would not be bullied and forced into leaving Portugal against their wishes. On Saturday that week, the Portuguese police acknowledged for the first time that Madeleine could be dead. Chief Inspector of Police Oligaro Sousa told the police that new evidence had intensified fears that Madeleine might be dead, but made a point of saying that the parents were not under suspicion. Less than a month later, that was to change dramatically. 
the McCanns reacted once again via a family friend by denouncing the police for not having the decency to inform us first about their new theory. Portuguese press reports suggested that the Madeleine McCann investigation had now entered a decisive phase. They were not wrong. Two days later, the McCanns did a round of interviews with Spain's three top-selling newspapers, claiming that there was a very real possibility that Madeleine was still alive. No doubt that took a little bit of organising by their media relations expert, Clarence Mitchell. The leaks continued, suggesting that evidence from the cadaver dog's alerts and DNA test results proved that Madeleine McCann must have died in the McCann's apartment. On the 24th of August, the McCanns were forced to react again, this time attacking preposterous speculation about Madeleine's fate. Jerry McCann says he is disappointed that so much information has been made public despite Portugal's strict judicial secrecy laws. A week later, on Friday the 31st of August, the McCanns announced they were going to sue a Portuguese newspaper, Tal and Qual, which reported, correctly as it happens, that the police believed the McCanns were responsible for their daughter's death. Months later, the magazine folded. The McCanns never sued them. Events soon overtook them. Another week later, on Friday the 7th of September, the McCanns were taken in for questioning by the Portuguese police. They attended voluntarily. They were not arrested, but they were interviewed under police caution. So let's now go to Kate McCann's account of her interview by Portuguese police, where she is shown a lengthy video of the cadaver dog Eddie alerting to the scent of a corpse in the McCann's holiday apartment. On page 248 of her book, Kate McCann writes, Carlos, my solicitor, had advised me not to answer any questions put to me. He explained to me that this was my right as an arguida, suspect, and it was the safest option. Any responses I gave might unintentionally implicate me in some way. On page 249, if I'm honest, I'd been quite nervous about seeing the video of the dogs. I had no idea what to expect, although I was quite sure something couldn't be quite right about the results they had apparently produced. We knew from Bob Small, a Leicestershire police officer, that the responses of specialist dogs were intelligence, not evidence. But in my head, I'd built up these film clips into the most damning evidence imaginable. Now Ricardo was giving me his spiel about the dogs. These dogs have a 100% success rate, he said, waving an A4 document in front of me. 200 cases and they've never failed. We have gone to the best laboratory in the world using low copy DNA techniques. I just stared at him, unable to hide my contempt. What did he know about low copy DNA? These dogs had never been used in Portugal before. He knew little more about them than I did. Then Kate McCann describes the video she watched. The dogs went into our apartment, ran around the apartment, jumping over beds, into the wardrobe and generally having a good sniff. She then describes this significant moment. At one point the handler directed the dogs to a spot behind the couch in the sitting room close to the curtains. He called the dogs over to him to investigate this particular site. The dogs ultimately alerted. I felt myself starting to relax a little. This was not what I would call an exact science. At this point we can begin to see how Kate McCann is trying to minimise the impact of Martin Grimes' report. Here, in a spot between the curtains, behind the sofa below the window, Eddie, the cat of a dog, alerted most excitedly. His nose was certain. There had been a corpse there. Later, Keeler the bloodhound located body fluids at precisely the same spot. Contrary to the impression given by Kate McCann in the above passage, the dogs were not together on the same day. They went on different days so as to get two separate sets of indications from the two dogs. Kate McCann continues on page 250. To pour scorn on the dogs' alerts in the underground car park, where the McCann's car and nine others were parked, she noted that her car had posters of Madeline on it. And so the handler, Martin Grime, she says, would have noticed that. In one passage she writes, the handler stopped next to our Renault and called the dog. It obeyed, returning to him, but then ran off. Staying by the car, PC Grime instructed the dog to come back several times and directed it to certain parts of the vehicle before it eventually supplied an alert by barking. Did you notice that word eventually again? It implies that the dogs only alert anywhere after the dog handler has directed them to spot where he wants them to alert. 
Continuing down page 250, Kate McCann describes how the Portuguese detective, Ricardo Paiva, shows her video excerpts of the dog's alerts and then adds that in certain places blood had been found which matched Madeline's. Kate says, I said I couldn't explain it, but neither could he. She continues, I remember feeling such disdain for Ricardo at this point. What was he doing? I thought, just following orders. Under my breath I found myself whispering, Fucking tosser, fucking tosser. This quiet chant somehow kept me strong, kept me in control. This man did not deserve my respect, fucking tosser. So let's summarise before we move on to other topics. Kate McCann thinks one of the lead detectives on this case is a fucking tosser. Jerry McCann ignores the wealth of evidence that sniffer dogs are used reliably not only for blood and the scent of corpses, but also for drugs, explosives and even certain medical conditions. He pigeonholes them all as incredibly unreliable. And both of them maintain that the most respected and sought after dog handler on the planet doesn't know what he is talking about, effectively accusing him of gross professional incompetence. Now we'll have a detailed look at how the McCanns dealt with this explosive evidence, yet another aspect of the case that mainstream media won't touch with a barge bowl. You can judge for yourselves how successful or otherwise they were. And we look at one US legal case the McCanns quoted in support of their claims that cadaver dog evidence was unreliable, the murder of Jeanette Zapatar. And so we come, finally, to how Kate McCann now explains all the dog's alerts, 11 by the cadaver dog and another 5 in the same locations by the blood dog. On page 250 of her book, when researching the validity of sniffer dog evidence, Jerry would discover that false alerts can be attributable to the conscious or unconscious signals of the handler. From what I saw of the dog's responses, this certainly seemed to be what was happening here. Let's be quite clear here. The McCanns are claiming that the dogs were plain wrong. They are saying that all 16 alerts by the two dogs were false alerts. They maintain that top sniffer dog handler Martin Grime didn't know what he was doing. It amounts to a libelous attack on Martin Grime, basically accusing him of gross professional incompetence. Now that was what the McCanns said about the dogs in a book first published in 2011, four years after Madeline went missing. But when the dog's alerts to a corpse and to blood were first reported to the press in August 2007, they reacted very differently. Let's examine what they said at the time. They came up with at least seven different excuses. The first was that any blood found in the flat, apparently found having oozed underneath the tiles in the living room behind the sofa, where the wall and the floor meet, might have come from Madeline's grazing her leg when she boarded the plane. It is very unlikely, however, that a graze on a knee at East Midlands Airport would produce significant blood hours later in Portugal. Any light bleeding from the graze would surely have stopped long before the plane touched down. The second excuse was that any blood might have come from a nosebleed. It was said that Madeline used to have frequent nosebleeds. Both of these explanations seem highly unlikely, given the amount of blood that would be needed for a small amount to seep through the tiles. In addition, it is hardly likely that blood from a graze on a knee or a nosebleed would be located at the edge of a room where the wall joins the floor. Nosebleeds usually leave only a few spots of blood, if any on flooring, usually being contained by a tissue or handkerchief or clothing. It's highly unlikely that Madeline would have sat still while copious quantities of blood poured from her nose or knee onto the tiled floor, right by the living room wall. One of the more entertaining reasons for blood spatters being found on the wall was given by Jerry McCann's sister, Philomena McCann, a teacher at Ullapool High School. She claimed that they could have come from mosquitoes crashing into the walls. Funny though that they only crashed into the area below the window in the sitting room and not anywhere else in the apartment. That became the third excuse. Now we move on to reasons given for the scent of a human corpse having been found in the McCann's hired car. The fourth excuse was that the dogs had alerted to the smell of the twins' dirty nappies being carried in the back of the Renault Scenic. 
That amounted to a suggestion that Martin Grimes' cadaver dogs could not distinguish between the smell of a toddler's faeces and the scent of the past presence of a human corpse. The fifth excuse was that the dogs got confused with the scent of rotting meat. But these excuses failed to explain that as well as Eddie the cadaver dog alerting to the smell of death, Keela the blood dog had also alerted to the presence of blood and other body fluids. An ingenious sixth reason was put forward, this time by Kate McCann's mother, Mrs. Susan Healy. She claimed that the smell of death may have been found on her clothes because Kate was said to have been in close proximity with no fewer than six corpses in her last two weeks at work. So far as this excuse is concerned, the claim that she visited any corpses during the last two weeks at work, never mind six, has never been confirmed. Further, those doctors who have to certify the cause of death do not always handle the body, nor handle it long enough or closely enough for the smell of death to be transferred to clothes. Further, this excuse only explained the smell of death on Kate's clothes. It didn't explain how the smell of death came to be found at four places in their holiday apartment, nor in their hired car. A seventh excuse was given to explain why the cat of a dog Eddie alerted to the scent of a corpse on the pink soft toy Cuddle Cat. Kate explained that she sometimes took Cuddle Cat to work. A newspaper report based on sources within the Portuguese police explained at the time, Kate didn't contradict the fact that her two pieces of clothing and the stuffed animal Cuddle Cat had been signalled by the English dogs trained to find cat of order. She justified it by her profession. Kate McCann's mother alleged that as a doctor at the Leicester Health Centre, she was directly present at six deaths before she came to Portugal on holiday, giving the same excuse for Madeline's stuffed animal that was with her in the months after her daughter disappeared. Quite apart from being unlikely that a mother would take a child's favourite stuffed animal to work, never mind having it with her when she was close to corpses, it appears that experts say that it is not usually possible for the smell of death to be transferred in this way. Altogether then, within the space of weeks, the McCanns had given these seven bizarre excuses for the alerts of the cadaver and blood dogs. But these excuses were all very unconvincing. Let's now go straight to the witness statement by Jerry McCann, given by him when he was interviewed under caution by the Portuguese police on the 7th of September 2007, the day he was declared a suspect. It was a long interview, beginning at five past four and going on until ten to nine at night. During this interview, Jerry was also shown videos of the dog's alerts. Here is how the interviewing officer recorded Jerry's responses. After viewing the films, and after the signalling of cadaver order in their room, next to the wardrobe and behind the sofa against the window in the living room, he says that he has no comments, neither has he any explanation for this fact. The dog that detects human blood signalled human blood behind the sofa mentioned above. He says that he cannot explain this fact. Regarding the cadaver order in the car that was rented at the end of May, he says he cannot explain more than he already has. Regarding the presence of human blood in the boot of the same vehicle, he says he has no explanation for this fact. When confronted with the fact that Madeline's DNA was collected from behind the sofa and in the boot of the vehicle and analysed by a British laboratory, he says he cannot explain. When asked if on any occasion Madeline was injured, he says that he has no comments. In the aftermath of the shock of Kate and Jerry being made suspects, the McCanns and their ever-growing team of PR advisers and lawyers immediately began to pour scorn on the evidence of the cadaver dog and the bloodhound. They quickly cited, for example, an Irish court case where the judge would not accept the cadaver dog evidence alone because it was not corroborated. They claimed there were Irish and American lawyers who had been able to cast doubt on cadaver dog evidence, pointing to a US study which allegedly showed that cadaver dogs could be fallible. One case in particular was trumpeted by Jerry and promoted in the British press, that of the arrest of an American, Eugene Zapatar, for the murder of his wife, Jeanette Zapatar. Jeanette Zapatar was still missing, but a cadaver dog had alerted to the scent of a corpse in locations at their house and at a storage container associated with Eugene Zapatar's business. On the 17th of September 2007, just 10 days after the claimants had been pulled in for questioning by the Portuguese police, the Times published an article titled, Kate and Jerry McCann send to US for help against evidence of sniffer dogs. The article told us, the parents of Madeleine McCann have contacted the lawyers of a man charged with murder who successfully challenged sniffer dog evidence. His lawyers claimed it was unreliable and persuaded a judge in the US to throw out 
prosecution claims that the dogs had detected the smell of a corpse. Jerry and Kate McCann hoped that the case could help them to prove their own innocence. Portuguese police believe that the couple may have killed their child accidentally and then disposed of the body using a car they hired 25 days later. Although the McCanns do not know the full details of the Portuguese prosecutor's case against them, they are concerned that it may rest on the dog's reaction. Now their lawyers have requested the case files from the ongoing murder trial of Eugene Zapatar in Madison, Wisconsin. His estranged wife, Janet, a 37-year-old flight instructor, vanished in October 1976 after taking her children to school. Her body has never been found. Detectives suspected that Mr. Zapatar killed her, but did not have enough evidence to go to court. Mr. Zapatar, 68, was charged with murder last year after sniffer dogs were brought in. They allegedly detected the scent of human remains in a basement at the former family home. But Dane County Judge Patrick Fiedler ruled that the evidence was inadmissible, saying that the dogs were unreliable. He quoted analysis of the three dogs' performance record, which showed that they were respectively incorrect 78%, 71%, and 62% of the time. The judge told the court, The state has failed to convince me that it's any more reliable than the flip of a coin. That is what the British press have told us about. But now comes the bit the British mainstream media have never told you about. Not long after the Times article, Eugene Zapatar confessed to killing his wife, and in making a full confession, he confirmed that the alerts of the sniffer dog used to search for where his wife's corpse may have been placed were wholly correct. In late 2007, a US newspaper reported, Zapatar enters guilty plea in connection with missing wife's death, the Eugene Zapatar case. During the past two decades, the ability of sniffer dogs to reliably detect an increasing number of substances has expanded greatly. Wikipedia, for example, tells us that sniffer dogs are used for all these purposes. Wikipedia adds that one notable quality of detection dogs is that they are able to discern individual scents even when the scents are combined or masked by other odours. We know from Martin Grimes that Eddie had never once been wrong in over 200 cases where he detected the smell of death or blood. Cadaver dog evidence has played a part in the conviction for murder of many criminals beside that of Eugene Zapatar. Here's a list of some of the cases where sniffer dogs have resulted in convictions or raised major doubts about claims by their parents that their children have been abducted or just disappeared. Finally, what are we to make of the attacks by the McCanns on the professional competence of the dog handler sent to Portugal, Martin Grime? The McCanns have publicly trashed his work on their daughter's disappearance, claiming that the dogs were doing no more than responding to his conscious or unconscious signals. But this is the first time that you give us uh, a big interview, uh, not being a guidos, not being a guido since then. Uh, so now I feel free to ask you this directly. Uh, how can you explain the coincidence of the scent of the cadaver, of cadaver felt by British and not Portuguese dogs? Sandra, maybe you, you should be asking the British? judiciary because they've examined all this. But don't you have an explanation I mean, where else for that? Madeline's mum and dad? And we're desperate for people to help us find Madeline, which is why we're here today. The majority of people are inherently good, and I believe the majority people in Portugal are inherently good people and we're asking them if they'll help us spread this message to that person or people. So you don't have any explanation for that? Ask the dogs, Sandra. Ask the dogs, no Jerry. Now I think that I, I feel free to ask you. Uh, don't you feel free to answer me? I can tell you that we've also looked at evidence about uh, cadaver dogs and they're incredibly unreliable. Unreliable? Cadaver dogs, yes.
Welcome, I'm Richard D. Hall and I'm here in Portugal, Praia de Luz. Now the reason why I've come here is because I'm making a series of documentaries about the Madeleine McCann case. Why am I making programs about that? Well, it's because I'm sick and tired of misleading media headlines about the incident. In these films, I will expose the hard facts about the incident and also what has happened since the incident. The documentaries clearly show the last place to get truthful information from is mainstream media and I will also expose those who are controlling mainstream media. In our first two shows, we've examined some of the key statements made by the McCanns and their friends about what they insist was the abduction of Madeleine. We saw how there were numerous changes of story and outright contradictions. And we saw how the stories surrounding what was supposed to be the last time Madeleine was seen by anyone other than the McCanns, namely their close friend David Payne, was riddled with a series of clear contradictions. The accounts of this supposed visit, when Dr. Payne claimed to have seen all three children dressed in white pyjamas and looking angelic, were so at odds with each other that anyone would have had good reason to doubt whether this visit ever took place at all. We referred to the report of Police Inspector Tavares de Almedia, who at the time the McCanns were pulled in for questioning, filed a detailed report giving numerous reasons why the police were sure that Madeline had died in the McCanns' apartment and that therefore they must have hidden her body. And then finally, we examined the convincing evidence provided by one of the world's top dog handlers, Martin Grime, and his two cadaver dogs, Eddie and Keeler, who alerted to the scent of a corpse in eleven places and to blood at some of those locations. We then saw how the McCanns struggled in all sorts of convoluted ways to try and explain why the dogs alerted to the smell of human cadaver and blood. Now it's time to throw light on a matter that's never been covered before on any film, TV documentary or YouTube video, nor in any newspaper articles, for the simple reason that this subject is too hot for others to handle. For the first time on film, we're going to take you right behind the scenes and expose what has really gone on in the private investigations mounted by the McCanns. You'll be able to judge for yourselves whether this much trumpeted and expensive private investigation was ever about a wholehearted search for Madeleine, or whether this operation might have had a wholly different purpose. But before we go to the extraordinary details of what the McCanns private investigators were really doing, how was it all funded? Most of it, from what we have been told, was in fact funded by you, the great British public. Just 13 days after Madeleine was reported missing, and at a time when she could have been found at any time, the McCanns launched a fund, which was officially called Madeleine's Fund, leaving no stone unturned. Let's now take a little look at how and why this fund was set up in the first place. Exactly when it was that the McCanns thought of setting up a fund to find Madeleine is not really certain. In her book, Madeline, Kate McCann explains it like this. On page 120, she says, Jerry had set himself the challenge to leave no stone unturned. There were so many people who desperately wanted to help. Jerry's call to arms spurred them into action. Then she says, Jerry McCann's sister, teacher Philomena McCann, sent a chain mail around the world asking every recipient to help find our little girl, followed by her claim that, this led to a first conversation between Philomena and Callum McRae, a former pupil of hers and an IT whiz kid, about establishing a website for Madeline. Four pages on in her book, Kate introduces the shadowy group called the International Family Law Group. They appeared to consist of just a barrister who didn't give his name to the McCanns and a paralegal. Later, a third shadowy figure joined them from an organisation called Control Risks Group, who said, Just call me Hugh. The barrister had apparently offered the McCann's help immediately he heard the news about Madeline going missing. It was on Friday the 11th of May, barely a week after Madeline had been reported missing, that these two men of mystery, the barrister and the paralegal, flew out to Praia de Luz. 
no one knows who paid for this visit, so we are invited by the McCanns to believe that this was the selfless act of a good Samaritan. However, on page 125, Kate McCann does tell us a little more about this third figure. It transpired that he was a former intelligence officer, now a kidnap negotiator and counsellor. She then explains why the fund for Madeline was set up. We had discussed the offers of help that were pouring in, including many financial pledges. One of Jerry's colleagues said his staff want to make a donation, but didn't know how or where to deposit it. The IFLG told us we needed to set up a fighting fund. They would devise the objectives of the fund and instruct a leading charity law firm, Bates, Wells and Braithwaite, to draw up articles of association. According to this account then, this fund for Madeline was all somebody else's idea and recommendation. And so it was that just days later, the organisation Madeline's Fund, Leaving No Stone Unturned, was founded, and the McCanns began collecting what turned out to be millions of pounds, donated mostly by the ever-willing and generous great British public. In a moment we are going to examine how all that money has been spent, or perhaps, as I'll show, frittered away. It's important to emphasise that Madeline's Fund is not a charity, although many people think that it is. It is in fact a private company, set up as a trust. And importantly, it is controlled by the McCanns and members of their family. The current directors of Madeline's Fund are Jerry McCann, Kate McCann, Brian Kennedy, uncle of Kate McCann, Edward Smethurst, the McCann's coordinating lawyer and a top Freemason, John Corner, close family friend of the McCann's and Madeline's godfather, and Michael Linnett, family friend and accountant, member of a secret of Catholic Masonic Society, the Catenians. What was the original purpose of this fund, though? The honest answer is that it was intended to be a fighting fund to meet legal expenses. In other words, from the get-go it was intended to provide funds for the defence of the McCanns. Just ten days after Madeline had been allegedly abducted, and could still have been found alive, why would the McCanns be thinking of needing a legal fighting fund? It was a relative of theirs in the same village, Kate McCann's uncle, Brian Kennedy, who gave the game away in a TV interview in the village. But I'm joined now by Madeline's great uncle, Brian Kennedy, and he's going to tell us about the fighting fund. Um, what's been the public's response to it, Brian? Well, it's been very good so far, but a lot of people have said they're not quite sure how they can give money, so may I tell them? Yes, very briefly. Right, yes. very briefly. You can go into any branch of the NatWest or the Royal Bank of Scotland and just say that you would like to make a contribution to the Madeline Fund. But tell me Brian about all the people that have been coming up to you today just literally stuffing money in your hand. Yes they have. It's, it's very touching, very touching. I, I, I would just say this is not an appeal. The family haven't made an appeal. We've just set up a mechanism for people who said they wanted to do something and contribute so that the money can be used uh, for all sorts of reasons, but probably mainly for legal expenditure. That was an honest answer. The McCanns already knew or sensed that they would be needing top-line solicitors and barristers. And indeed, over the past seven years, the McCanns have had legal help worth an estimated £4 million or more. Here's a list. They have spent five years trying to claim £1 million damages from Dr. Conchalo Amaral, the coordinator of the initial investigation into Madeline's disappearance and attempting to ban his book, The Truth About a Lie. They spent nearly £400,000 silencing retired solicitor Tony Bennett with a libel action after he wrote two books on the case. And they've spent a small fortune on legal advice from a series of top solicitors and barristers who have advised them in relation to their having formally been declared suspects in the disappearance of their own daughter and the risks of being extradited to Portugal to face charges. But very soon the message was changed. The fund was not to be used for legal expenses, apparently. Instead it was to be used to find Madeline, and they launched a major Look for Madeline campaign. How much the McCanns have raised in the way of donations and other contributions to their fund is shrouded in mystery. Equally unclear is exactly how all the money has been spent. Although the Madeleine's fund directors have produced annual reports, as required by company law, these are very opaque. Dublin-based accountant Enid O'Dowd has written a major analysis of the fund, titled Madeleine's Fund, Review and Investigation of Accounts. Enid O'Dowd's report shows that the company only complies to the bare minimum with legal requirements and does not show a detailed breakdown of where the income has come from and on what it's been spent. 
and this despite the McCann's claim that they wanted their fund to be transparent. But we don't have time to dwell on the operation of the fund. What we do know is that a significant portion of the fund has been spent on a series of detective agencies and investigators. I'm now going to put them under the microscope. But first let me explain how the McCann's private investigation operation has been directed and by whom. The first thing to say is that the McCanns have always maintained that decisions about the private investigation have been made by the directors of Madeline's Fund, whose names I have mentioned, but the real controller of the McCanns private investigation all along has been a Cheshire businessman by the name of Brian Kennedy. This is not Kate's uncle Brian Kennedy who lives in Rothley. This Brian Kennedy is a major multi-millionaire businessman. He lives in a palatial mansion in the Cheshire countryside. He has a large business empire which includes his Latium Group based in Wilmslow, Cheshire and double glazing companies such as Weatherseal. His companies have a number of times come under scrutiny for what we might call sharp business practice. Most recently this year when the now defunct Office of Fair Trading issued a damning report on Kennedy's Weatherseal company. He is perhaps most well known beyond the world of business as the chairman of successful rugby club Sale Sharks who are also based in Cheshire and for his bold but unsuccessful attempt to take over Rangers Football Club. But his venture into sport has not always been successful. Under his ownership, Cheshire-based Stockport County Football Club plummeted four divisions and out of the Football League. How did Brian Kennedy get involved in being the head of the McCann's private investigation? In her book, Kate McCann gives this account. On Wednesday the 12th of September, just three days after the McCann's had returned from Portugal, Jerry was contacted by Edward Smethurst, a commercial lawyer. He represented a businessman called Brian Kennedy, a successful entrepreneur who owned various companies, including Everest Windows. He said that Brian, like many people, had been following the unfolding drama of Madeline's disappearance. And now, seeing things going from bad to worse, he could no longer stand idly by and watch. And so it was that just two days later, a top London lawyer, Angus McBride from city firm Kingsley Napley drove all the way up from the south to Rothley to pick up the McCanns and drive them to a meeting in London where they met with Kennedy for the first time and a battery of top lawyers. The McCanns claim that it was only after this meeting that Brian Kennedy devised his campaign to run a private investigation to find Madeline. Kennedy promptly bought a house in Nutsford, again in Cheshire, as the base for his investigation. He and the McCann team have been very secretive about this base but clips of it were shown in a Channel 4 documentary on the case shown in May 2009. Kennedy made two swift decisions. He appointed an expert in money laundering, Gary Hagland, as his British-based lieutenant, whilst at the same time making the seemingly bizarre decision to appoint a highly controversial Barcelona-based detective agency, Metodo 3, translated as the third method, to try and locate Madeline. So let's take a look at Gary Hagland and what we know about him and his work for Brian Kennedy and the McCann team. Here's a summary of what we know about his personal history. He was born in 1954 and is now 60. He appears to be unmarried. We know that he worked in a branch of the security services in the Criminal Intelligence Department of Hong Kong Royal Police from 1979 to 1985 when he appears to have returned to England and settled in a comfortable apartment in Nottingham. What he did for the next six years is a mystery, but in 1991, at the age of 37, we find him employed as an Associate Director of Compliance at accountancy firm Albert E. Sharp & Co. Compliance is an area of practice which deals with complying with ever stricter financial regulations. For him to have become a Compliance Director, Hagland would have had to have been familiar with all the up-to-date financing and banking regulations, including knowing all about the various scams and schemes associated with money laundering, a major part of the modus operandi of drug lords and other major criminals. In 1993, he published an article, also covering money laundering, in the Journal of Financial Regulation and Compliance, titled, Effective Compliance versus Regulatory Gestation. Clearly, he was very much an acknowledged expert in money laundering by this time. During the 1990s, he suddenly becomes the director of a number of companies whose precise purpose is obscure. And then in 1999, we find an article about him in a journal called Money Laundering Bulletin. Two years later, in 2001, we find an article about him in the Financial Times Director magazine, where he is described as follows. 
Gary Hagland is a consultant with law firm Rag & Co advising clients on the active management of compliance risks including money laundering. Mr Hagland paints a broad picture of the type of non-financial services businesses that may well be targets for the money launderer. According to Mr Hagland, a problem for companies in complying with anti-money laundering activities is that their prevailing culture and ethos does not lend itself readily to accommodate scepticism about prospective customers. Rather, the opposite is likely to be the case. To tackle the possible threat of being unwitting accomplices to a money laundering scheme, the challenge for non-financial businesses is to change their mindset, their core attitudes. The reputational focus of most businesses is clearly not on money laundering, says Mr Hagland. The risks associated with money laundering are clear enough. Money laundering is a criminal offence. Any individual caught helping to process the proceeds of crime faces a lengthy sentence. Companies which stand accused of assisting with money laundering operations also risk substantial damage to their reputations. But how can you tell a money launderer? Money launderers are extremely well funded, well advised and make use of technically elaborate and sophisticated schemes to cover their tracks. We are left in no doubt at all. Gary Hagland is a sought after man because of his experience in one thing in particular, money laundering. So why was it that in September 2007, or maybe even before then, that Cheshire businessman Brian Kennedy hired Hagland as his right-hand man and his liaison officer with the controversial Spanish detective agency Metodo 3? Was it because he had any sort of track record in tracing and finding missing children? Clearly not. Why hire a man who is an acknowledged expert in financial compliance to look for a missing child? Hagland was to carry on working for Brian Kennedy and the McCanns, meeting with investigators from Metodo 3, both in their Spanish headquarters in Barcelona and in Brian Kennedy's headquarters in Knutsford. It's time now then to take a very close look at this Spanish detective agency, Metodo 3. Little has been written up about them in the mainstream British press. The tabloids would merely recycle claims by the McCanns' public relations officer, Clarence Mitchell, about what a great detective agency it was explaining that the Spanish agency was carefully chosen for its reputation and its position close to Portugal. He explained that because Portugal did not allow ongoing private investigations whilst there was an official police investigation, they could not employ a Portuguese agency. The next best thing was a Spanish agency. When the broadsheet papers attempted more in-depth articles about Metodo 3, however, they were much more sceptical. A good example was one by Christine Toomey in The Times. She visited Metodo 3 in February 2008 and was seriously unimpressed by what she saw. Her article was titled, Madeleine McCann and Metodo 3, Private Eyes, Public Lies. In the autumn of 2007, Metodo boss Francisco Marco claimed that we believe she is in an area not far from the Iberian Peninsula and North Africa, adding, we have proof of her movements after her kidnap and we know she was alive the day after her disappearance. I talk of certainties because we know which group may have her or could have kidnapped her to sell her on. I cannot say who she is with because we are putting together conclusive proof that we can present to authorities. It was all utter lies. Two months before Toomey's visit, Marco had infamously made a series of boasts headlined in the British media. He first of all claimed that he knew that Madeline was alive and where she was. Then his claim that his men were closing in on the kidnappers. Finally, he boasted that Maddie will be home for Christmas. These were the most outrageous, blatant lies. Yet these lies were never condemned by the McCanns. In fact, they carried on using the services of this discredited agency for at least another 15 months until using them until at least March 2009. In her article, Christine Toomey noted that on the very day Mr Marco bragged about Madeleine McCann being Home by Christmas, Metodo 3 moved from a cramped premises above a grocer's shop specialising in sausages in Barcelona's commercial district to a multi-million pound suite of offices in a grand villa on one of the city's most prestigious boulevards. 
At the time, Matodo 3 were four months into a contract with the McCanns, worth a reported £600,000 in total. How much did the McCann team pay Matodo 3 for their services? On the 29th of November 2007, Jerry McCann on his personal blog wrote that the Fine Madeline Trust was paying the £50,000 a month fees. It was then mostly the generous British public with their generous donations which was funding this detective agency. If the McCanns carried on employing them for 15 months after Francisco Marco's lying boast that Maddie will be home for Christmas, we must assume that the McCanns were very happy with their work. We will examine more of that work in a moment. Back to Christine Toomey's article in The Times. She made some acid comments on what she found in her visit. There is no discernible ringing telephones, little sign of activity of any kind, other than a woman searching for a lead to take a pet poodle for a walk and the occasional toing and froing of workmen putting finishing touches to the sleek remodelling of the office complex. Opposite the boardroom is an open plan area of around half a dozen cubicles, equipped with banks of phones and computers. Most are empty when I arrive. That tended to expose Marco's claims to have 40 people employed full-time or part-time in the search for Madeleine as false. The British press at the time, however, simply printed this unlikely claim without questioning it. Toomey went on to observe how defensive Matodo three were about their involvement in the search for Madeleine. Speaking to the boss, Francisco Marco, and his cousin, José Luis, she received this stern warning from Luis, We don't answer any questions about Maddy. Maddy is off limits. Is that understood? She continued, after talking to Marco for half an hour, I concluded that what motivates him, as much as, if not more than his professed desire to present Madeline with the doll he boasts he carries around in his briefcase to hand to her when he finds her, is a sense of self-regard, self-publicity and money. She added that before its involvement in the Madeline McCann case, Metodo III specialised in investigating financial swindles, industrial espionage and insurance fraud. Money laundering was another of its areas of expertise. There is no evidence that Matodo III had any experience whatsoever in searching for, let alone finding, missing children, though they had made a completely false claim to have located 23 children. Toomey describes how her interview with Matodo III ended. When I ask Marco to elaborate on the 23 missing children he claims his agency has located in the past, Marco eases himself away from the table for the first time, tilting far back in his chair. He cannot talk about that on the grounds of confidentiality, he says. Shortly after this, his cousin José Louis, who has sat mostly silent until now, calls time on the interview with a chopping motion of his hand. It's clear that Matodo III had a very controversial history. One journalist who investigated them by visiting Barcelona spoke to the police and other reputable detective agencies there. All of them, without exception, described Matodo III as a disreputable, dodgy, rogue agency. One Spanish private investigator told the Daily Mail, Matodo III have portrayed themselves as the best investigators in the world. The truth is, they are nothing of the sort. Their murky background is riddled with controversy. Why would the McCanns choose the most disreputable private investigation agency going in Barcelona? Matodo III's boss, Francisco Marco, was described by leading Portuguese criminologist Mr. Moita Flores as a crook, and indeed last year Marco was arrested and charged with spying on a leading Spanish politician by illegally recording her private conversations in a restaurant. It caused a major scandal in Spain. Also arrested with him was his colleague Julian Perebenez, one of Matodo III's men most involved in the Madeleine McCann case. He soon admitted his guilt, having confessed to planting illegal bugging devices in the restaurant. When spotted by TV cameras walking side by side with the McCann team's private investigation head, Brian Kennedy and Pryde Luz, he was keen to avoid them. Many of the Matodo three detectives were once arrested in a phone-tapping scandal linked to leading politicians and businessmen. Five senior members of Matodo three, including Francisco Marco, were held in 1995 amid claims of industrial and political espionage, with Marco's mother, Martina Fernando Lado, 57, who founded the agency in 1985, being led away in handcuffs. She was arrested as she handed a client a cassette containing an allegedly illegally phone-tapped conversation. At the same time, police raided Matodo 3's Barcelona offices, seizing handguns, ammunition, listening equipment, cassettes and transcripts of illegally taped phone calls. Subsequently, Mrs. Lado was found to have made phone calls offering a telephone tapping service for a fee of around £20,000.
Mrs. Lero's husband, Francisco Marco Poilo, and Marco's brother, Francisco Gabriel Fernandez Lado, were also arrested. Also, Sergio San Celestino, an employee of Spanish telephone company Telefonica, was suspected of illegal phone tapping and was proved to have close links with employees of Metodo 3. Amazingly, the prosecution of Metodo 3 was inexplicably dropped. None of them were convicted at that time for their alleged illegal phone tapping and firearms crimes. Not long after Christmas 2007, the McCann team nearly suffered another major embarrassment when their lead investigator on the Madeleine McCann case, Antonio Jimenez Raso, once described as Matodo III's detective in charge of special operations, was arrested on serious criminal charges. They only escaped embarrassment by some clever spinning of their chief public relations officer, Clarence Mitchell. Antonio Jimenez Razo was soon afterwards charged, along with his twin brother, with stealing 400 kilograms of cocaine nearly half a tonne, from an illegal shipment of 1,500 kilograms said to have been worth £25 million on a ship coming from Venezuela. He was also charged with breach of trust, misconduct in a public office, that is corruption, corruption of public officials and illicit criminal association. The alleged offence occurred in December 2004 and involved what a court was later to describe as an exceptionally violent and ruthless criminal gang involving at least 27 individuals. It emerged that Gimenez Rasso had until December 2004 worked as a chief inspector in the Drugs and Organised Crime Unit for the Barcelona Regional Police. He had left the police under mysterious circumstances just when an internal investigation was looking into how those 400 kilos of cocaine had disappeared. He then went to work for the controversial Matodo 3 detective agency in August 2005, joining the McCann's team's private investigation two years later. He spent the next four years in jail, remanded in custody. After a long process of investigation, during which the criminal gang tried various means, including making violent threats to the prosecutor to disrupt the matter coming to trial, and then tried to wreck the trial itself, Jimenez Razo was lucky to escape without punishment, as his active participation in the work of the gang could not be proved. But the judge admonished him sternly, telling him that as a former senior police officer, he had become far too close to the gang members. How deeply had Gimenez Razo, this close associate of drugs lords and crime gangsters, been involved in working on the Madeleine McCann investigation? Very deeply. It has now become clear that an early suggestion of the McCanns was to suggest to the world that Madeleine had been stolen to order by a wealthy North African family and was probably in Morocco. The McCanns visited Morocco in June 2007 and promoted Madeleine's disappearance while they were there. A number of people visiting Morocco claimed to have seen Madeleine, but that was at a time when the media frenzy was at its height and Madeleine was being seen here, there and everywhere. Once Brian Kennedy was made the operational head of the McCanns' private investigation and he had appointed Gary Hagland as his liaison man with Matodo 3, the two men lost no time in working out a detailed plan which focused on promoting the notion that Madeleine was most likely in Morocco. Hagland was sent to London to discuss the Moroccan project with a former MI6 colleague who worked on the Foreign Office's Moroccan desk. A huge boost to what we might term the McCanns' Moroccan project came when there was a burst of media speculation in late September 2007 about whether a white girl being carried on the back of a Moroccan peasant woman could be Madeleine McCann. As it turned out, the girl, Bushra Bashina, was proved just days later to be a Moroccan girl being carried by her mother. How the photograph of her came to be taken, and how the McCanns came to get it before it got to the police, remains, like so much else, a deep mystery. It was clearly the McCann team who briefed the press and gave the media the photograph in question. Here is how Kate McCann explains it all in her book. On the 25th of September we heard that a little blonde girl resembling Madeleine had been spotted with a group of Moroccan peasants. We received a photograph. She doesn't explain who took it nor how it got to them. She goes on to say that the child looked too young to be Madeleine, adding that the picture was too grainy for us to be absolutely sure. The day the photograph appeared in all the British press, 25th of September, as Kate says, a contingent of the press pack jumped on planes to Morocco to try to track down Madeleine. She then explains that Brian Kennedy called us later that evening to ask if we would like him to fly out to Morocco to find out for certain. 
Kate says they were not sure this was necessary or wise. But she says off went Brian on his plane, his own private jet, to northern Morocco. It sounds as if this was just a spur-of-the-moment decision by a genuine man just wanting to do all he could to find Madeline. However, what Kate McCann appears to omit in her book is that this was no snap decision by Brian Kennedy. It seems he may have pre-arranged to meet Matodo 3's man in Morocco, Antonio Gimenez Razo. The plane flight to Morocco may have been arranged a week or two in advance. The publicity about Bushra Bushina simply appears to have coincided with his pre-planned visit. Antonio Jimenez Raso, a Spaniard, was the McCann team's main man in Morocco, also a Spanish-speaking country. This would enable him to work on the ground in Morocco and converse easily with those he wanted to speak to. The stated purpose of Jimenez Raso being based in Morocco that autumn was simply to find Madeline. But let's now examine his actual actions. One of his key roles appears to have been simply to look for any witnesses who were prepared to say they might have seen Madeline alive. There were reports that Gimeno Raso and other Matodo 3 detectives were going around Morocco offering ready cash to anybody who would say that they had seen Madeline. This was dramatically confirmed by a newspaper report stating that the Moroccan government had taken the highly unusual step of expelling a man who had been visiting hotels and garages in various parts of Morocco offering people money if they could claim to have seen a girl looking like Madeline. The report did not name the man or his nationality but it could well have been Gimenez Raso. After this we suddenly find Antonio Gimenez Raso and his boss Francisco Marco turning up at the Portimao police station which was the headquarters of the official investigation in Portugal. They were there to talk to the Portuguese police. This was on the 13th of November 2007 and with them for this most important meeting was the man directing the McCann's private investigation, Cheshire multimillionaire Brian Kennedy. So what was this meeting between the Portuguese police and the McCann's private detective all about? It had come about with the help of Gimenez Raso. He had used his various connections with the police in Barcelona to get the Barcelona police chief to ring his opposite number in Portugal and ask for a meeting. He said that Matodo III had vital evidence about who might have taken Madeline. The meeting was duly arranged and Brian Kennedy jetted in from Cheshire to meet three Portuguese police officers. The Matodo three men had flown several hundred miles to attend this meeting. Kennedy flew some 1,500 miles. They must have considered it worth it. There, the three men wove elaborate and believable tales about three possible suspects. The Portuguese police took notes. They followed up what may have seemed promising leads to them. None of them came to anything. The only purpose they served, in fact, was to waste valuable police time. We have established then that Gimenez Raso spent four years in prison, remanded in custody for offences connected with his associations with members of a violent criminal gang. We have established that the McCann team not only employed him, but that he was the leading detective used by the McCanns. When Gimenez Raso was arrested in February 2008, the press immediately pointed out that he was one of the McCann's private detectives. How did the McCann team react? They denied it outright. Their spokesman Clarence Mitchell said, he is not one of our team. It was an outright outrageous lie as we've just shown. That wasn't the only meeting that Brian Kennedy had that day however. Let's have a quick look at the other meeting he had that evening. His meeting was at a villa near Praia de Luz called Sal Salito. It was at the home of Ralph and Sally Evele, the aunt and uncle of Robert Murat, the man who was made the first formal suspect over the reported disappearance of Madeline back on the 15th of May that year. So in the distance there you can just see the property of Sal Salito, I'll just, I'll just point to it. This is it here, the Everlays property, Sal Salito. And this is the location that the Portuguese police searched in connection uh, with the Madeleine McCann disappearance. It was a high-powered meeting. Robert Murat was there, so was his high-powered lawyer, Francisco Pagaret. Brian Kennedy also brought his lawyer along the equally high-powered lawyer, Edward Smethurst. Smethurst had been for years Brian Kennedy's in-house lawyer for his Latium Group business empire. He had also been appointed allegedly at a meeting on the 14th of September in London as the coordinating solicitor for Kate and Jerry McCann. In addition, he was a top Freemason. He is a senior Freemason in the East Lancashire Masonic province and is also called past worshipful master of his lodge.
Smethurst had been fully involved in the Masonic movement since his teens, after his father died suddenly in a mysterious fire. His mentor in the lodge was the former head of legal services at British Nuclear Fuels Limited, Alvin Shuttleworth. After he qualified as a lawyer, Smethurst was given the job of assistant legal officer by his mentor, Shuttleworth where he soon became involved in defending compensation claims from leukemia victims in Cumbria who lived near the Sellafield nuclear site. In November 2007, Smethurst appeared in a panorama program on Madeleine's disappearance. It was quite clear when Kate and Jerry came back to the UK that they were subject to an open season of uh, abuse in the media. They'd obviously gone through the tragedy of having the daughter taken in very unfortunate circumstances. And to make matters infinitely worse, uh, we're now subject to a trial by media. So the main question we have to ask about this meeting is, what was it for? Here in the same room together, we had the first suspect, Robert Murat and his lawyer, Smethurst, the lawyer for the second and third suspects, the McCanns, and the McCanns team's head of their private investigation, Brian Kennedy. The meeting was kept secret, but leaked out in local Portuguese newspapers. Kennedy was asked why he had flown out all the way for a private meeting with the then chief suspect, Robert Murat. He replied, to offer him a job helping to find Madeline. You can judge for yourself how credible an explanation that was. But we must now move on to examine the role of Antonio Gimenez Raso and his boss, Francisco Marco, in another very bizarre and disturbing set of events. Some of you watching may remember, back in the winter of 2008, the scenes of a team of divers looking in a murky lake for Madeline's bones. At the very centre of this search for bones was another man we must now introduce. Also part of the Matodo 3 setup, a lawyer called Marcos Aracao Correa. He was a young lawyer in his early thirties who hailed from the island of Madeira. When the story first broke in late 2008, he presented himself as a good Samaritan type bloke who dipped into his own pocket to fund this search, based, he said, on information received. So what was this information received? He told an extraordinary story. Days after Madeline was reported missing, he said, what he referred to darkly as underworld sources had told him that Madeline had been abducted then raped, then killed, and then her body had been thrown in a murky lake. He said he had told Portuguese police about his information, but they had ignored him. He had then set about working out where this murky lake was, and, using clues received in a vision or a dream, he had got out some maps, toured the area, visited several lakes, and decided that Madeline's body must be in the Arada Dam. There was a tower by the side of the lake. He had reasoned that if, as he had been told, Madeline had been thrown in the lake, she must have been thrown in from the tower. Accordingly, he instructed his divers to search just the part of the lake that was near the tower. He, or others, had made sure the media and press were there to record the event, and Britain's mainstream media, as usual, lapped up and uncritically recycled the story as gospel. There was only one problem with the story. It was utter bilge. Total lies from start to finish. In the end, Marcos Correa was forced, under the pressure of relentless questioning from the media, to admit that he had told everybody a pack of lies. He said he would now tell the truth. The new story ran as follows. Two days after Madeline was reported missing, he went to his first ever spiritualist church meeting. He went home and then had a vision of a huge powerful man strangling a blonde girl about Madeline's age. Later, he says, he heard about the disappearance of Madeleine McCann and linked his vision with her disappearance, and that is how he became interested in her. Later, another vision of a murky lake came to him, and that, again with the aid of maps, led him to the search of the Arada Dam. Unfortunately, for Marcos Correa's credibility, that story also crumbled under pressure, and he had to admit that that one was false as well. To return to the searches of the dam, there were two, one in late January and early February, and another week-long search in March. In each case, a team of British divers was used. Once again, Marcus Correa, under pressure, admitted that another part of his original story was also a lie. 
He was not, in fact, a good Samaritan after all. He had been paid by Matodo III to carry out these searches of the dam. And, of course, Matodo III was being employed by Brian Kennedy on behalf of the McCann team. So in searching this dam, who was this man really working for? Quite plainly, he was working for the McCanns. And as most of the money for employing Matodo III was coming from the generosity of the British public, it was our donations that were funding this search. He first of all said that he had paid for these searches of the dam out of his own pocket. In the event there was much media coverage of both the searches. An item of clothing was found which it was said could be Madeleine's. It wasn't. Then a bag of bones was found which it was claimed could be Madeleine's. They were ostentatiously passed to the Portuguese police. They weren't Madeleine's bones. They were animal bones. Eventually the searches were called off. But now we come to a still more sinister part of this story. And that is that this search of the Arada Dam was planned at least seven weeks before it happened. As Marcus Correa later explained in a magazine article, he had met with Francisco Marco and Antonio Gimenez Rasso of Matodo III at this very Arada Dam on the 10th of December 2007. This may have been the very first time that Marcos Correa had been introduced to the two Matodo III investigators. They each had to travel a very long way. For Marco and Gimenez Rasso, the trip from their Barcelona base was 700 miles. From Marcos Correa's base on the island of Madeira, it was nearly 1,000 miles. Who was it arranged for this meeting? Correa, as we've seen, worked for Matodo III. We know that Francisco Marco and Gimenez Rasso from Matodo III were employed by Brian Kennedy from September 2007. Therefore, all three were Matodo III men, appointed by Brian Kennedy on behalf of the McCann team. Therefore, what appeared at first sight to be a genuine effort by a good Samaritan to check out information he had received that Madeline's body might have been thrown in the Arada Dam turns out instead to have been a meticulously planned event by Matodo III. And in funding this search, with the help of donations from the British public, they were relying, we now find out, on a man who lied through his teeth not once but twice about how he came to be interested in what really happened to Madeline. The more you peer into the events and people behind this search for bones in the Arada Dam, the more it has every appearance of being just a plain stunt designed to grab front page coverage in the British press. We have to ask, why did the McCanns do this? What was the whole purpose of this exercise? Why did three people employed by the McCanns travel a total of thousands of miles to meet at the dam in December 2007? And why, when news of the search broke in late January, were the British public not informed about the lead-up to this search? Before we leave the subject of Matodo III, I should just mention that its boss, Francisco Marco, was also involved at the same time as he had the Madeleine McCann contract in a major agricultural scam. This was exposed on the 2nd of February 2009. The case involved embezzlement and money laundering, that was hardly surprising, given Matodo III's record in involvement in money laundering. Basically, the Catalan regional government had commissioned and paid for a large number of expert reports. But these reports, said a state prosecutor, had no purpose or interest. One of the most blatant examples was the payment of Matodo III of nearly £30,000 for a wholly unnecessary socio-economic inquiry on hazelnut farming. The Clean Hands Collective, which campaigns against corruption, found out that the socialist agricultural adviser, Joaquim Lina, had asked Matodo III to carry out a hazelnut inquiry. But Matodo III's report was found to be merely a cut-and-paste job from an internet report on the hazelnut industry in a regional magazine, El Confidencial. In other words, Matodo III had got £30,000 for doing nothing of real value. In March 2008, the McCanns ceased using Matodo III full-time, but retained their services on a part-time basis. It's time now to look at the extraordinary person the McCanns and Brian Kennedy now put in charge of their search for missing Madeline. It was a company with the grand title of Oakley International. When news that Matodo III had been replaced leaked out in the press, the McCann spokesman Clarence Mitchell described them as the big boys of international private investigation. Once again, the British mainstream press simply reproduced this claim without bothering to look behind it. In fact, Oakley International was basically a one-man band run by an Irish fraudster and conman, Kevin Halligan. 
also involved with him was ex-MI5 friend Henry Exton. We would know very little about Halligan but for a penetrating article published on the 24th of August 2009 by security expert and writer Mark Hollingsworth in the Evening Standard. These were the main facts that he revealed. Brian Kennedy and the men he employed, such as Matodo 3 employees we've looked at, scared off witnesses, talking to them so aggressively that some of them later refused to talk to the police, wasted funds and raised false hopes. Brian Kennedy and his son Patrick had to be questioned by Portuguese police after attempting a rash 24-hour stakeout of a house where they thought Madeleine was being held. She wasn't being held there. The relationship between Matodo III and the Portuguese police then completely broke down. Kennedy's investigators had little experience of the required painstaking forensic detective work. In his article, Hollingsworth noted that Exton had once worked for MI5 but was sacked after being arrested, caught leaving a tax-free shopping area at Manchester Airport with a bottle of perfume he had not paid for. He accepted an official police caution. As for Kevin Halligan, Hollingsworth was damning. Halligan used a variety of names indeed when he met the McCanns he told them his name was Richard Halligan. He falsely claimed to have worked for GCHQ and made other false claims and extravagant claims about himself. In 2006, the year before Madeline went missing, he secured a contract with Dutch firm Trafigura. They had dumped toxic waste in a landfill site near Abidjan the main city in Ivory Coast causing severe physical illness to hundreds of people living nearby. The government had imprisoned some of Trafigura's executives. Trafigura appointed Halligan on a lucrative contract to help with negotiations to release its executives. He failed, meaning that Trafigura had to pay the eye-watering sum of around £125 million to secure the release of its executives. As Hollingsworth pointed out, Halligan made a fortune from Trafigura and was suddenly flying everywhere first class, staying at the Landsborough and Stafford Hotels in London and the Willard Hotel in Washington DC for months at a time. He then went on to describe what Halligan was doing when he was supposed to be working for the McCanns. He actually only worked for them for four months, as his six-month contract was terminated early. During this time he was paid the sum of half a million pounds plus expenses. It was a daily rate of about £6,000 a day. On top of that, his first month's expenses claim was nearly £50,000. Yet he had absolutely no experience in tracing and finding missing people. During the Madeline investigation, says Hollingsworth, Halligan spent vast amounts of time in the Hey Joe bar in the basement of the Abracadabra Club near his German Street office. Armed with a clutch of unregistered mobile phones and a Blackberry, the bar was in effect his office. He was there virtually the whole day. He had an amazing tolerance for alcohol. When not imbibing in St. James's, Halligan was in the United States. On the 15th of August 2008, at the height of the McCann investigation crisis, he persuaded Andrea Hollis, a former U.S. Drug Enforcement Agency official, to write out an $80,000 check to Oakley in return for a 10% shareholding. The money was then transferred into the private accounts of Halligan and his girlfriend, Shirin Trakitis, to finance a holiday in Italy. Halligan later faced a $6 million lawsuit in Virginia concerning an allegation that he repeatedly and systematically depleted funds from Oakley's bank accounts for inappropriate personal expenses. He faced a further £1.4 million damages claim from Mark Aspinall, a lawyer who had worked closely with him. He had invested half a million pounds with Halligan's Oakley International Company and lost the lot. Hollingsworth added that numerous employees, specialist consultants and contractors hired by Halligan had not been paid, adding that some of them now face financial ruin. Hollingsworth concluded his article by telling us that Halligan was now on the run from his numerous creditors and various law enforcers. It was in October 2009 that a sharp-eyed lady recognised Halligan's face from a photograph in the press. He had been spotted staying at the £700-a-night Oxford Hotel with his then-girlfriend. The police bundled him into a van and put him in Belmarsh Top Security Prison. He fought extradition for three years, finally being removed to the US, where he pleaded guilty to serious fraud offences. He served a total of four years in prison. Once again, we must ask, why did the McCann team turn to an out-and-out -out fraudster like Kevin Halligan? who had no ability or experience in tracing missing people. 
The McCann team had on board the McCanns themselves, both doctors, one of the country's most experienced PR experts, Clarence Mitchell, Brian Kennedy, a multi-millionaire businessman and his commercial lawyer, top Freemason Edward Smethurst. How could the McCanns spend well over half a million pound raised from the caring British public on this man? As one might expect, Kate McCann in her book glosses over this appalling episode, portraying themselves as naive. She wrote, the first and second phrases of the contract, April to July, ran fairly smoothly. Oakley had put in place systems to gather, collate, prioritise and follow up information coming in. There was little doubt at that stage progress was being made. But that simply wasn't true. Halligan achieved nothing. He did not take the investigation one jot closer to finding out who took Madeline and where she might be. And let's just have a look at these so-called systems that Halligan put in place for following up information coming in. One of these was Halligan's hiring of a company in Virginia in the US to follow up calls to the much trumpeted investigation hotline promoted by the McCanns. This was a telephone number published on the McCanns website, Find Madeline, which had the strap line, pick up the phone and bring Madeline home. Its director, Johan Selle, however, told the Mail on Sunday that neither the McCann team, nor Kevin Halligan, nor anyone else had followed up the single call made to the so-called hotline. This was what Daniel Boffey of the Mail on Sunday wrote. The headline ran, iJet director claims that the McCanns never followed up calls to their telephone hotline. Madeline McCann investigator didn't listen to any tip-offs given to hotline. He continued, Perhaps of most concern about Halligan is the lack of attention paid to the hundreds of phone calls received to the Madeline hotline. Halligan and Oakley International, based in Washington, failed to listen to a single call received on the hotline set up for potential informants by Kate and Jerry McCann last year. Johan Selle, the director of operations at iJet, revealed that for a year nobody even asked his company if they could listen to any of the calls received. He said his operators in Annapolis, Virginia, had answered hundreds of calls, but the information seemed wasted, possibly squandering valuable leads. He said, we delivered Oakley a report with a summary of the calls, and said if they wanted to come back, they could listen to the recording. But nobody did. For someone with an understanding of the case, it would be very easy for some to say that maybe 80 or 90 percent of the calls were hogwash. But there may be a percentage where one would say, maybe we should listen to this one or listen to that one. But our understanding is that this never took place. We are not sure whether Halligan provided our report to the family, or to the trust, or to those working for them, or to the teams working after him, because no one came back to us. We sent the report to the Oakley Group, and our assumption was that they were using it as a piece in the puzzle. But it appears that wasn't the case. The firm says it was not paid for its services by either Halligan or Oakley International. Time after time the McCanns begged the public to make that one phone call. Help us find the key that will unlock this puzzle. Help us find the missing piece of the jigsaw, and so on. It seems from what Selle told the Mail on Sunday that the hotline was bogus. All you could ever do on the McCanns investigation line was leave a message. Nobody ever got an answer. That would be one thing, but Mr. Selle's evidence suggests that by the spring of 2008, the hotline was a complete sham. The Mail on Sunday article also gave further shocking particulars about what Kevin Halligan was actually doing whilst he was supposed to be looking for Madeline. Here is more from Daniel Boffey's article. Halligan squandered more than half a million pounds. In just one month, for example, he spent more than £3,000 just on dining out with his girlfriend. In fact, whilst supposedly working to find Madeline, he launched an extraordinary spending spree on hotels, restaurants and luxury goods. In his first two months as lead investigator in the search for Madeline, Halligan spent £7,000 on a personal chauffeur. Later, on a short trip to New York with a girlfriend, he lavished $1,600 on Salvatore Ferragamo leather goods, £5,500 on handbags, £500 on an Italian meal, £150 on a pair of designer glasses, and £900 on a three-night stay at a five-star Renaissance hotel. Already the owner of a £1.5 million mansion, he also paid out during this time more than £50,000 on plumbing and mosaic tiling for his house in Great Falls, Virginia. He spoke of extravagant schemes he was developing to catch the abductor. One of the more bizarre claims was that he hired an actor to pretend to be a drunken priest, 
who would seek confessions as he toured the bars of Bride Luz, the resort where Madeline disappeared. He told others that a family with a Madeline look-alike daughter had been paid to set up home in a nearby resort in order to tempt out a potential kidnapper. There is no evidence that he did either of those things. Indeed, acquaintances describe him as a Walter Mitty character. After being pursued by creditors demanding to be paid for work done helping him, Halligan fled to Rome with Miss Trashitis. Almost immediately after arriving in Rome on their first-class Lufthansa tickets, Halligan withdrew hundreds of thousands of pounds more from Oakley International's bank accounts, was seen drinking and spending prodigiously at the Hilton Cavalieri and Excelsior Hotels in Rome, before quietly slinking back to the UK a few months later. Halligan was a fraudster, conman and thief. He served four years for some of his frauds. The McCanns, Clarence Mitchell, Brian Kennedy and Edward Smethurst are all top-notch professional and business people. How can we possibly explain this high-powered group of professional people employing such a low-life fraudster for the task of looking for Madeline and the person who allegedly abducted her? It's a question which cries for a clear answer, but the McCanns have never given us that clear answer. We must therefore use our own gifts of inference to try and work out what was the real reason they employed him. We've looked so far at the first two phases of the McCann's private investigation. Phase 1, the employment of the most disreputable detective agency in Barcelona, Metodo 3, together with the employment in England of expert in money laundering and financial compliance, Gary Hagland. And Phase 2, their employment of Kevin Halligan, a serial conman and convicted fraudster. In Part 4, we'll conclude our probe into what really went on in the McCann's private investigations and conclude our series of films with an examination of the British government in assisting at every opportunity the McCanns to maintain their claim that Madeline was abducted.
Welcome, I'm Richard D. Hall and I'm here in Portugal, Pride de Luz. Now the reason why I've come here is because I'm making a series of documentaries about the Madeleine McCann case. Why am I making programs about that? Well, it's because I'm sick and tired of misleading media headlines about the incident. In these films, I will expose the hard facts about the incident and also what has happened since the incident. The documentaries clearly show the last place to get truthful information from is mainstream media and I will also expose those who are controlling mainstream media. To sum up, we have looked at three sets of investigators who were employed by the McCanns to search for Madeleine for the year from September 2007 to September 2008. Gary Hagland's speciality was money laundering. Metodo 3 was a thoroughly disreputable detective agency who were frequently involved in or suspected of criminal activity. Halligan was an out-and-out -out fraudster and liar, another criminal. Three Metodo 3 men who worked on the Madeleine McCann case, Francisco Marco, Julian Parabenez and Antonio Gimenez Rasso have all spent time in jail following allegations of criminal activity. One of them, Gimenez Rasso, being in jail for four years. Kevin Halligan was also jailed for four years. None of these agencies or individuals unearthed one single usable fact about who might have taken Madeline or where she was. Between them, the McCanns probably paid them a total of well over £1.5 million, with absolutely no result. Where is the mainstream media's coverage of these extraordinary facts? Nowhere. This brings us back to the reason why Clarence Mitchell, the head of Tony Blair's media monitoring unit, was appointed to the job of being the head of PR for the McCanns. He once boasted to a Spanish magazine, L'Espresso, I was the head of the 40-strong Central Office of Information media monitoring unit. My job there was to control what comes out in the media. Enough said, I think. After the McCann team sacked Halligan in August or September 2009, Brian Kennedy turned to two local contacts to head up the McCann team's investigation. One was former Detective Inspector Dave Edgar, who lives in Crewe, just a few miles from Brian Kennedy's mansion. The other was another retired police officer, Arthur Cowley, who lived in a hilltop cottage on Halkin Mountain, in Flintshire, North Wales. Their main activity over the next three years seemed to have been to promote a series of unlikely stories about who might have abducted Madeleine, which I'll look at in a moment. But first, let's look at yet another deception perpetrated by the McCann team in relation to these men. In truth, they were men local to Brian Kennedy, handpicked by him to work in his investigation office in Nutsford, Cheshire. But Kennedy and the McCann team tried to pass the two men off as heading up an already established and successful private investigation agency. They chose to mislead the press and the general public in thinking that Dave Edgar was the boss of a successful detective agency called Alpha Investigations Group. There was only one problem with this. There was no such detective agency. It was just two men chosen by Kennedy and working completely under his direction. It was not what it seemed but the McCann team's strategy was brilliantly successful. The mainstream press simply lapped up the misinformation coming from the McCann team's PR men. In a moment I'll explain how this deception was perpetrated, but first let's look at the way mainstream press simply recycled the McCann team's deception over Alpha Investigations Group. One of the first mentions of this bogus Alpha Investigations Group came in the article in the Belfast Telegraph on the 13th of September 2009 and in a parallel article based on the same source in the Independence Sunday Life magazine. The article claimed that Sunday Life can now lift the lid on how Edgar's Alpha Investigations Group Private Eye Agency really operates. Renowned for leaving no stone unturned in his UK murder investigations, Dave now spends his days with a four-strong team probing every lead that comes into his office. The article referred to his business partner, Arthur Cowley. This was no lifting of any lid, it was simply the media printing what the McCann team was telling them about Dave Edgar. 
In fact, it is us here at Rich Planet TV who are now lifting the lid on this and all the other things about this private investigation that have been deliberately hidden from the public until now. It was, however, back on the 14th of May 2009 that the Daily Mirror first mentioned the bogus Alpha Investigations Group. The article praised Edgar to the skies for being one of the most brilliant detectives Britain has ever had, citing his alleged work in solving the murder of Gary Newlove. The Mirror then told us that Edgar found himself at the heart of several successful murder investigations in Cheshire, whatever that might mean. The Mirror then told its readers, Mr Edgar now runs the Alpha Investigations Group with business partner Arthur Cowley. In a Daily Star report a week later, the McCann team's PR spokesman Clarence Mitchell was quoted as saying that Mr Edgar is following a potentially vital new lead. For operational purposes, I cannot say where Mr Edgar and his team are exactly, but they are following up a very encouraging lead. Mr Edgar believes Maddie could be hidden in peasant villages close to the Algarve resort of Praia de Luz, where she was snatched. Mitchell misleadingly referred to Edgar and his team. It was not Edgar's team, it was Brian Kennedy's. Then the Independent on the 23rd of May chipped in with a long article by Cajal Milmo. Once again, Edgar and Cowley were portrayed as amongst the most dedicated and brilliant detectives in the land. Milmo then claimed, newly retired detectives and their uniformed counterparts are entering the nebulous and lucrative world of private investigation, such as those running the Alpha Investigation Group, the company headed by former detectives Dave Edgar, 52, and Arthur Cowley, 57, which has been employed since last year by the Find Madeline Fund. Pausing there, the Independent in this one sentence has claimed two key things. One, that there was a company called Alpha Investigations Group and two, that the Find Madeline Fund was employing this company. Other media quickly followed suit. On the 26th of May, the thisischeshire.co.uk news website referred to Dave Edgar and Arthur Cowley, the duo who now run the Alpha Investigations Group. The previous day, the Daily Telegraph had claimed on the 25th of May, stating, the search for Madeline is now being headed by two retired policemen, Dave Edgar, a former RUC and Cheshire police officer, and Arthur Cowley, previously of Merseyside Police, who run Alpha Investigations Group. One newspaper even referred to a claim that the McCanns have used the company since some time the previous year, i.e. 2008. These claims essentially portrayed Alpha Investigations Group as a long-established, successful private detective agency headed by Dave Edgar. None of it was true, as we shall now see. These are the facts. One, there never was a company involving Messrs Edgar and Cowley called Alpha Investigations Group. Two, a company with a similar name was, however, formed several weeks after all these stories appeared in the press. Three, it was called Alfag, not Alpha Investigations Group, and was formed on the 16th of June 2009, nearly five weeks after Alpha Investigations Group received its first public mention in the mirror. Four, Alfag was formed as a one-man band company with Cowley as the sole director. 5. The base of Alfag was not in Cheshire, as claimed in the mainstream media. It was Arthur Cowley's home in the Flincher Hills. 6. In fact, Edgar and Cowley were operating from Kennedy's office in Nutsford. 7. Dave Edgar, who was portrayed in the mainstream press as the director of this allegedly successful company, in fact had nothing to do with it. He was neither the owner, nor even a director, nor even a shareholder. 8. Alfag had no employees. 9. Alfag has never had any presence on the internet. 10. Alfag had no assets to speak of. 11. There was no evidence that Alfag had ever traded. 12. Alfag never had an office. Apart from Edgar and Cowley using Kennedy's Nutsford house, its registered address was Treetops, Pant -e Goff, Halken, Flincher, CH8, 8DH. 13. The company was numbered 0692937 and incorporated on the 10th of June 2009. 14. Its sole owner was Arthur John Cowley. There is no mention of Dave Edgar being involved with this company at all. We can also demonstrate that the McCann team were actually behind the creation of Cowley's Alfag company. On the 12th of January 2009, a full five months before Cowley's company was registered at Company's House, the domain name alfake.co.uk was registered by one Andrew Dickman. It turned out that he was a business partner of Brian Kennedy. 
the Manchester Evening News said on the 21st of May 2007 that a property business owned by shale sharks and Everest double glazing chain tycoon Brian Kennedy has secured a £60 million funding boost for expansion. Patrick Properties was established in 2002 by Mr Kennedy and Managing Director Andrew Dickman. May be using his friend and business partner Andrew Dickman to register this domain name was meant to conceal the involvement of the McCann team and Brian Kennedy in setting up the bogus Alfig company. Well, if so, it hasn't worked. As so, we have established that all the media stories about Alpha Investigations Group are untrue. Amazingly, Edgar himself admitted this by stating that he was not part of Alpha Investigations in what was a highly critical article about the Madeleine McCann private investigation published on the 15th of August 2009. This was a story about the McCann team searching for an Australian woman who looked like Victoria Beckham. It was one of the most ridiculous stories the McCann team ever produced, so let's have a quick look at it now. It was, for a start, a story or a lead to which the McCann team attached great importance. They even held a special news conference to promote it. It was so important that the McCann's chief reputation manager, Clarence Mitchell, chaired the press conference, with their lead investigator, Dave Edgar, present as well. They had maps and artist sketches at the ready. We might note, first of all, that this latest lead is said to have taken place in Barcelona, the HQ of the dodgy Spanish detective agency Metodo 3. The outline of this story ran as follows. A British businessman, said to be a banker, has been agonising for two years about an encounter he had on the dockside of Barcelona, Spain, three nights after the disappearance of Madeleine McCann. Now, after two years of agonising, he had come forward. Not to the police, but to the McCann team. He said that he had been drinking in Barcelona's bars for several hours that evening. Indeed, one newspaper described him as a stagnite reveller. At two o'clock in the morning, a woman with an Australian accent had approached him. She asked him, have you got my new daughter? He said, no. She looked a bit like Victoria Beckham. It was suggested that Madeleine might have come on a boat from Portugal round the Mediterranean to Barcelona, and that the woman was arranging to meet a man on the Barcelona dockside so that she could take her as her new daughter on a yacht to Australia. And that was it. On this slender foundation, the McCann team organised a press conference at which dozens of journalists and cameramen turned up. Edgar claimed it was not only a lead, but a strong lead, and indeed this story prompted a worldwide alert and search for the woman in Australia. Let us now turn to the damning criticism in the Mail on Sunday of this little episode. Days previously, an earlier article by Jerry Lawton had proclaimed that Detectives hunting missing Madeleine McCann are to quiz the skipper and crew of a £6 million superyacht. The move came after its millionaire owner, Rhonda Wiley, 52, and daughter of Melissa Carlson, 31, vowed to do all they could to help. The 105-foot yacht was spotted in a Barcelona marina three days after Madeleine disappeared in 2007. The vessel, flying an Australian flag, was moored close to where the Aussie Posh Spice lookalike approached a Brit stagnite reveller and muttered, Are you here to deliver my daughter? But Tom Warden, Martin Delgado and Andrew Chapman in the Mail on Sunday took apart this so-called strong lead. They said private detectives leading the hunt for Madeleine McCann faced questions last night after a Mail on Sunday investigation revealed shortcomings in chasing a strong lead. Edgar's Detectives 1 failed to make even rudimentary inquiries before announcing a significant development in the worldwide search for the six-year-old. 2 failed to speak to anyone working at the seafood restaurant near where the alleged agitated woman was seen at 2am. 3 failed to ask the Port Authority about movement of boats around the time Madeleine disappeared. 4. Failed to ask if the mystery woman had been filmed on CCTV. 5. Knew nothing about the arrival of an Australian luxury yacht just after Madeleine vanished until told by British journalists who gave them the captain's mobile number. 6. Failed to interview anyone at a nearby dockside bar where, according to Mr Edgar, the mystery woman was later seen drinking and seven failed to ask British diplomats in Spain for advice before or during the visit. Also, Spanish police could not confirm that they had ever been contacted by the British investigators. The Mail on Sunday attacked Edgar's failure to question several people who might have had vital information before calling a news conference. But then maybe dramatic news headlines were all that the McCann team really wanted from the story. The Mail on Sunday spoke to José Luis López, 
owner of the El Rey de la Gamba restaurant where the mystery woman was seen. He said the McCann's private detectives did not make any inquiries at my restaurant. I am almost always here when the restaurant is open and my staff would have informed me if anyone had approached them about such an important matter. You are the first person to ask about this Australian woman. The manager of the bar next door, Kennedy's Irish Sailing Bar, said the same. The Barcelona Port Director, Juan Guitar, asked about it. He said, Nobody has been here asking questions about Madeleine for this Australian woman. This is the first I have heard about any possible link to the port. A senior port authority worker added, There are several security cameras monitoring the port, but we have not been approached about footage from the night in question. I would have expected anyone carrying out the investigation to at least have asked about it. A source at the British Embassy in Madrid said, The detectives didn't inform us or the consulate in Barcelona that they were coming to Spain, nor ask any help in their investigation. A highly experienced private detective with over 20 years' work tracing missing people added, I can't understand why the Madeleine detectives would have released this story and leave it to the public without first making their own investigations in the port. It beggars belief that they did not speak to the owner of the restaurant or the port authorities. The McCann detectives had not even checked port records for the dates of the 6th and 7th of May, the days the British banker was in Barcelona. The Mail on Sunday, however, managed to see them and traced nine boats that arrived in the port, one of which was unfamiliar. It was a £6 million Sunseeker powerboat, Willpower, owned by an Australian multi-millionaireess, Rhonda Wiley. The Mail on Sunday interviewed the captain. They commented, Mr Edgar's team are in the embarrassing position of having to explain why it was left to reporters to discover the boat's presence in Barcelona and trace its former captain. The Mail on Sunday article was interesting for another reason. The McCann team sought to blame Edgar's assistant, Arthur Cowley, for the Barcelona debacle. Asked to explain himself, Edgar said, We are a small team. Mr Cowley's company had no connection with the Madeleine investigation. I am employed by the McCann family and I pick my staff. In these words, Edgar had effectively blown apart the claim that he was the boss of the imaginary Alpha Investigations Group. He, not Alpha Investigations Group, had been hired by the McCanns, and Alfeg was Cowley's company, not Edgar's as the mainstream press had consistently claimed. There was also one truly extraordinary statement made by Dave Edgar at this press conference. He referred to the abductor. He said the abductor might have been a woman, not a man. The statement completely beggared belief. The McCann's close friend, Jane Tanner, had insisted that at 9.15pm she had seen a man carrying a girl in pyjamas near the McCann's apartment. She described his long, sleek black hair, his dark jacket, his mustard-coloured chino trousers and his black winkle-picker shoes. The description was given to the world. Only five and a half months later, a ridiculous delay, did the McCann team publish this artist's sketch of the man said to have been seen by Jane Tanner. The sketch was circulated worldwide, being represented as the man who abducted Madeleine McCann. How then could Dave Edgar possibly say that Jane might have seen a woman, not a man? Clearly this led to people wondering if Jane Tanner's so-called sighting was a complete fabrication. Despite the fiasco of their attempt to pin the abduction of Madeleine on a young Australian woman who looked like Victoria Beckham, the McCann team, with the help of Dave Edgar, continued to work on a series of highly improbable stories about what really happened to Madeleine McCann. Let's move on to look at just one or two of the unbelievable stories developed by Dave Edgar. One of the angles the McCann team and Dave Edgar focused on was the possibility that Madeleine might be being held in an underground prison lair. This followed some well-publicised appalling stories of how girls had been kidnapped and held for years before finally gaining freedom. There was the case of Natasha Kampusch, abducted by Wolfgang Pricklepil, when 10 years old and held for 8 years before gaining her freedom. Then there was J.C. Lee Dugard, kidnapped by sex offender Philip Craig Garrido when aged 11, and held for 18 years before being freed. Then there was the evil Joseph Fritzl, who had held his daughter Elizabeth captive for 24 years and fathered 7 children by her. More recently there was the case of the three teenage girls held captive in Arizona for two years. 
Although the circumstances of what happened to these girls was very different from what the McCanns say happened to Madeline, this did not stop Dave Edgar strongly promoting what he said was his sincere conviction that Madeline was being held in a prison lair in the so-called lawless hills that surrounded the village of Priya de Luz, the village where she was reported missing. Despite these repeated claims, the McCann team never devoted any of the millions of pounds donated by the generous British public to make a single inquiry in the area. One storyline developed by the McCann team was to try to suggest that Madeline was abducted by a notorious British paedophile then living in Germany, Raymond Hewlett. He had, it is true, been staying in a camper van in Portugal, about 30 miles from Praia de Luz, at the time Madeline disappeared, but at the time he was in his late fifties and looked nothing like the man said to have been seen by Jane Tanner. And there were other indications that he could not have carried out the abduction. Hewlett died in December 2009, but that did not stop another attempt in which the McCann team were clearly deeply involved to bring his name into the search for Madeline. Other newspapers quickly recycled the story on their front pages. I know who took Madeleine McCann, deathbed letter from paedophile suspect makes abduction clue claim. A paedophile suspected of being involved in the disappearance of Madeleine McCann confessed to knowing what happened to the little girl on his deathbed, it has been claimed. Raymond Hewlett wrote to his estranged son denying he played a part in the three-year-old's abduction, but claimed he knew she had been stolen to order by a gypsy gang. Cancer sufferer Hewlett, who has a record of raping and abducting children, had previously claimed to have seen the missing toddler twice before she vanished in 2007. The story was literally incredible. It featured Wayne Hewlett, a builder from Telford, the long-time estranged son of Raymond Hewlett. Raymond Hewlett had been convicted of a string of sex offences, and his son Wayne had disowned him over twenty years previously. But the son solemnly told us in an exclusive Hewlett whilst dying on his deathbed in a hospital in ancient Germany had written his son a letter giving information about what really happened to Madeleine McCann. Hewlett told the son that a mystery man had brought this letter all the way from Germany. No one has yet volunteered who this so-called mystery man might be. The letter, so it is claimed, said the man years ago Wayne's father had been sitting around a gypsy campfire drinking with a gypsy gang leader. The letter gave the name of the gypsy gang leader and said that the gang leader had admitted to Hewlett that members of his gang had stolen Madeline to order on behalf of a wealthy North African family who wanted a young white girl in their family. One would think that any responsible person would have immediately contacted their local police station and handed them the letter allegedly containing the name of this gypsy gang leader. Instead, Wayne said that he had become emotional about it and burnt it. Having burnt it, he later decided to tell the McCann team, or the son, about the story. We can't be sure which came first, but what we can be sure about is that the McCann team and the son cooperated once again to put this story on their front page on the 1st of September 2010. In this final section of our in-depth look at the Madeleine McCann case, we are going to look at a significant aspect of this case which simply cries out to be explored. And that is the quite remarkable extent to which the British government and other political, media and establishment figures at the very highest level have been involved in actively assisting the McCanns and in promoting their claim that Madeleine had been abducted right from the very first day Madeleine was reported missing. So let's begin right away by introducing all the top-level people who rushed out to Praia de Luz in the first week after Madeline's parents first alerted the authorities that Madeline was missing. In doing so, let us bear in mind that it was always possible that Madeline might have wandered off, or that she could have been recovered from wherever she had been taken. One presumes that all those who rushed out to Praia de Luz were doing so in a bid somehow to find out what happened to Madeline McCann and hopefully find her alive. But as we take a much closer look at who rushed to get involved, we begin to wonder quite what was the agenda of some of these people and groups. An obvious place to start is by looking at what consular help the McCanns received from the British ambassador in Portugal. At the time Madeleine McCann was reported missing, Tony Blair was the British Prime Minister. His Foreign Secretary was David Miliband. His Chancellor of the Exchequer was Gordon Brown. The Blair government was renowned for the fortune of taxpayers' money spent on his PR men, spinners, or as some have called them, professional liars. 
A key person in this exercise in controlling the media was the head of the government's so-called media monitoring unit in the Central Office of Information. It reported straight to the Cabinet Office at No. 10 Downing Street. At its head was Clarence Mitchell, the very man who for the next seven years was to be the main point of contact for the media covering the Madeleine McCann story. As we saw in the first programme in this series, when asked what his role was at the media monitoring unit, Mitchell answered without hesitation to control what comes out in the media, which is exactly what he has done for the past seven years. And we know from a Freedom of Information request that Clarence Mitchell was formally appointed to head up the Madeleine McCann PR campaign on Sunday the 6th of May, barely 48 hours after Madeleine had been reported missing. What was it, we might well ask, which was so important about this story that the head of the government's main media unit needed to be sent out to Portugal full-time to cover this story? What exactly was the government's interest? What could a PR man do to help find out what happened to Madeleine McCann? Another leading civil servant sent out to Praia de Luz was Sherry Dodd, a left-wing journalist who worked for the Daily Mirror before Tony Blair appointed her his Special Foreign Office Ambassador to the McCanns the very next day after Madeleine's disappearance. That now makes two very high up civil servants dispatched to Portugal within 48 hours. It was described in some media as unprecedented. Dodd had been a long-serving senior spokeswoman for the government. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office announced that she was being deployed as the press officer responsible to act as media liaison officer for the McCann family. She flew out immediately to be at the McCann side for press conferences and to attend police interviews. Her instructions, so far as the public were concerned, were to offer every possible consular assistance to the McCanns. But it seems clear that right from the start her instructions were to do a lot more than that. Because of an international British government letter leaked to a Belgian newspaper, Le Denier Her, this is what the Belgian newspaper informed its readers. 1. An unnamed diplomat warned the government in a letter of inconsistencies in the witness statements testimonies by Madeleine's parents and their friends about the night she was reported missing, adding people were not where they claimed to be. 2. After visiting the McCanns, the diplomat voiced concerns about the confused declarations as to the precise whereabouts of Kate and Jerry McCann and their friends in the final hours before Madeleine's disappearance. 3. The letter went on to comment on the McCanns' lack of cooperation with the Portuguese police. 4. The letter stated that a senior civil servant at the Foreign and Commonwealth Office had earlier suggested to consular staff that they exceed their authority and put pressure on the Portuguese authorities. 5. The Foreign and Commonwealth Office in London had commanded that British Embassy staff give all possible assistance to the McCann couple. 6. Diplomats were told the McCanns must be accompanied at all times during any contact with the Portuguese police by either A. A member of consular staff or B. By British police officers sent out from the UK. We will come to the nature of the British police sent out to Portugal in a moment. 7. The author of the letter warned London of the risks of siding with the McCanns as completely as had been demanded. It said, with the greatest respect, I would like to make you aware of the risks and implications to our relationship with the Portuguese authorities if you consider the possible involvement of the couple. Please confirm to me, in the light of these concerns, that we want to continue to be closely involved in the case as was requested in your previous message. None of the contents of this explosive report from a British diplomat have ever been mentioned in the British press. We cannot be sure who was the author of this damning report, but all indications suggest that it was the senior Foreign Office civil servant we mentioned just now, Sherry Dodd. We do know on the record that Sherry Dodd's work in Portugal came to a sudden end on the 17th of May 2007, just a fortnight after Madeleine's disappearance. The indications are that Sherry Dodd compiled her damning letter within a day or two of her arrival in Portugal. She seems to have been the one person in the entire British government who was bold enough to express any doubt about the McCann's claim that Madeleine had been abducted. In 2008, a Freedom of Information request was made to try and obtain disclosure of the contents of all communications between the British Embassy in Portugal and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in London. This was denied on the grounds that the release of such information would in some way endanger or irreparably damage international relations between the UK and Portugal. The first government minister to get involved in the case was Gordon Brown. 
At the time he had been Tony Blair's Chancellor of the Exchequer for ten years. He was shortly to become Britain's Prime Minister. We know two specific things about his close involvement in the Madeleine McCann case in the first three weeks after Madeleine was reported missing. First, we know from Jerry McCann himself, and this has never been denied, that he made several mobile telephone calls to Gordon Brown himself. Don't you agree that there were a lot of details that in, in a certain way contribute to people to doubt of you? For example, uh, when you went to the Vatican so quickly, all the contacts that you've made. Can I ask you, Jerry, if you personally know Mr. Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister? No, and we still have never met Gordon Brown. We were spoken to him once on the phone several weeks after Madeline was abducted. Second, we know that Gordon Brown leaned on the Portuguese authorities to persuade them to release a description of a man with a child that the McCann's friend insisted had been near their apartment at about 9.15pm the night she was reported missing. The McCann's and Jane Tanner had told the Portuguese about this alleged sighting in the hours following Madeline's reported disappearance. But the Portuguese police, right from day one, thought her so-called sighting was fabricated. They did not want to release details of this sighting as they thought it would mislead the public. However, it is known that Gordon Brown spoke on the telephone to the Portuguese authorities, demanding that they allow Jane Tanner's sighting to be reported and asking for the public's help in identifying the suspect. And so it was on the 25th of May 2007, over three weeks after Madeleine had been reported missing, that Jerry McCann and his PR spokesman Clarence Mitchell summoned the world's press to make this announcement. The Portuguese police later released the same description, but in a very low-key announcement. The McCanns had got their announcement, but no artist's sketch or e-fit accompanied Jerry McCann's description. That was partly because Jane Tanner said she had seen the man sideways on and didn't see his face. It was also dark at that time, 9.15pm. It was an almost unbelievable five and a half months later that the McCann team did produce an artist's sketch, and this was it. It was hard to know what good this would do so long after the event, and without a face. When the sketch was eventually released, the British press obligingly and uncritically published it on all the front pages. Of course, it didn't lead to anyone being identified, but it did powerfully reinforce the idea that Madeleine really had been abducted in the public's mind. But why was Gordon Brown so much involved in this? He was not the Foreign Secretary, David Miliband was. And why was the government so much involved as to seek to force an obviously very reluctant Portuguese police force to allow a description of a man which had every appearance of being fabricated released to the world? Why would Gordon Brown not allow the Portuguese police to get on with their investigation unhampered? As we shall see a bit later, Gordon Brown got even more involved when he became Prime Minister. Tony Blair resigned as Prime Minister on the 27th of June 2007 to make way for Gordon Brown. But he and his wife Sherry were in direct touch with Jerry and Kate McCann. In fact, as Kate McCann relates on pages 118 and 119 of her book, she took a call from Sherry Blair at about 5pm on Tuesday the 8th of May, just five days after Madeline's disappearance. According to Kate, Sherry Blair said it was amazing but encouraging that Madeline was still the first topic on the news every night. Sherry Blair also put her in touch with the controversial founder of Parents and Abducted Children, Lady Catherine Meyer. It was less than 48 hours after this conversation that on the 10th of May 2007, Tony Blair announced that he would resign as Prime Minister the following month. Let me now switch the focus to the holiday company used by the McCanns and their friends, Mark Warner. There was no obvious reason why Mark Warner should pull in some of the biggest guns available in the world of PR, but they certainly did. Mark Warner retained the controversial PR firm Bell Pottinger. Controversial, among other reasons, because they were hired at a fee of tens of millions of pounds to provide PR for the highly undemocratic Democratic Public of Congo. Their support for this repressive regime recently brought protesters outside Bell Pottinger's Fleet Street offices, campaigning against Bell Pottinger's involvement in supporting the odious regime. 
Bell Pottinger is also paid tens of millions of pounds by other badly run African states. If Madeleine McCann had been abducted, it was not from a property owned by Mark Warner. Moreover, the McCanns had refused to employ evening childcare facilities laid on by Mark Warner at the Ocean Club premises where they were staying. They used neither the evening creche nor the baby listening service. Alex Wolfall, the head of crisis management at Bell Pottinger, one of the most senior men there, was dispatched immediately, arriving the following day on the 4th of May. Yet as we've been pointing out, as far as anyone knew at that stage, Madeline could have been found any day. How exactly the presence of the head of crisis management at Bell Pottinger could help in the police search for Madeline is not clear at all. One of the strangest things about this involvement is that no sooner had he arrived in Prior de Luz than he got hold of the McCann's cameras and began an immediate search for what was on them. He did so together with the McCann's relative from Skipton, Michael Wright. Quite why he did that is uncertain. One of the leading mysteries in the case is why the so-called last photo produced by the McCanns allegedly taken at precisely 2.29pm on the day Madeline was reported missing was not produced until a full three weeks later. Why, if it was on the camera on the 3rd of May, was it not released for three weeks? Why, in fact, did the head of crisis management at the powerful media relations firm of Bell Pottinger need to look at the McCann's camera at all? In her book, Madeline, Kate McCann gives an interesting, if selective, account of the events leading to Jerry McCann's emotional statement to the media at 10pm on the day after Madeline's reported disappearance. What is interesting is the sheer volume of important people milling around the McCanns by 5pm on the 4th of May, just 19 hours after the McCanns had first reported her missing, and just 8 to 9 hours after the first news reports went out on Sky News, the BBC and ITV. Helpfully, she lists some of them. Alex Woodfall, Head of Crisis Management, Bell Pottinger, Public Relations Firm. Top staff from Mark Warner in Portugal, John Hill, Ocean Club Manager, Emma Knights and Craig Mayhew. The British Ambassador to Portugal, John Buck. British Embassy Press Officer, Andy Bowes. The British Consul for Lisbon, Liz Dow. The local British Consul, Bill Henderson, with a colleague, Angela Morado. Alan Pike, a trauma psychologist from the Centre of Crisis Psychology in Skipton, North Yorkshire. Some of the McCann's relatives had already arrived, Kate's mother and father and her aunt Nora, who had cancelled a flight back to Canada where she lived so as to be able to fly out to Portugal. So far as support from the British Embassy was concerned, the support and level of backup in respect of a child who had been reported missing just a few hours ago was totally unprecedented. Why did so many of them need to be there? In addition to all the many people we've already mentioned, we need to look at the involvement of the British security services, an aspect which has rarely been mentioned in the British mainstream press, about which the government has been singularly evasive. Two men from CRG had discussions with the McCanns and were certainly there within days, despite Dr Gerald McCann saying in late May to a TV interviewer that they had no plans to employ private investigators. They were Kenneth Farrow and Michael Keenan. Mr Farrow is the ex-head of the Economic Crime Unit in the City of London Police and Mr Keenan an ex-superintendent in the Metropolitan Police with specialist fraud and investigative experience. The McCanns were asked if now that they had already netted £300,000 in their No Stone Unturned fund, they would use any of that money for private investigators. Jerry McCann responded, The advice we have received is that private investigators will not help at the moment. Despite this clear claim, a private investigation agency known as Control Risks Group announced in September that they had been helping the McCanns since May and were in regular contact with them throughout. In the early afternoon of Sunday the 13th of May 2007, Jane Tanner, one of the McCann's friends and the person who says she saw an abductor, spoke to some of the people Kate and Jerry brought in. She was referring to Control Risks Group. Who brought them in and who agreed to pay for them? Why were Control Risks Group brought in so soon? To find a missing child or for other reasons? The involvement of the British security services very often means that the government has taken a keen interest in the matter. So just what was the government's interest in the mystery of the disappearance of Madeleine McCann? Now we come to yet another government agency which was involved from day one, 
the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Agency, or CEOP. This was an agency dedicated to the protection of children, especially from child sexual abuse, online grooming and child trafficking. It was absorbed into the National Crime Agency by the coalition government two years ago and no longer exists in a separate entity. At the time of Madeleine's disappearance, its head was the controversial figure of Jim Gamble. I say controversial because Gamble will forever be associated with Operation O, the investigation into those allegedly accessing images of child sexual abuse on a website. You could only access this website by paying by credit card online. A lot of UK users of this United States website was passed to the British authorities and handed to Jim Gamble and his team to investigate. Let's just go to Wikipedia and see what they have to say about Operation O and about its head, Jim Gamble. It was the United Kingdom's biggest ever computer crime investigation, leading to 7,250 suspects identified, 4,283 homes searched, 3,744 arrests, 1,848 people charged, 1,451 convictions, 493 people cautioned, and 140 children removed from suspected dangerous situations and an estimated 33 suicides. Operation O identified and prosecuted some sex offenders, but the validity of the police procedures was later questioned as errors in the investigations resulted in large numbers of false arrests. Its chief executive, Jim Gamble, was accused of using vague terms which do not have a recognised meaning within either child protection or law enforcement when they defended the operation. This accusation came from an article by Charles Arthur in The Guardian. Coincidentally, it was published on the 17th of May, just a fortnight after Madeleine's reported disappearance. Within days of Madeleine's disappearance, Jim Gamble, just like Alex Woolfall of Bell Pottinger, was on the hunt for photographs without, it seems, asking the Portuguese police for permission. Gamble begged the British public who had been on holiday the week the McCanns were there to send their holiday snaps. Quite why he thought this would help the Portuguese investigation is unclear. Indeed, we don't know if he ever sent these photographs to the Portuguese police. But SEOP had another controversial role in the initial stages of this investigation. The coordinator of the Portuguese investigation was Dr. Gonçalo Amaral. He wrote a book on the case and he was controversially removed from the investigation. The book was called The Truth About a Lie, but it was yet to be published in this country because of a five-year-long libel action in the Portuguese courts by the McCanns to try and have the book banned. It is actually still on sale and has been translated into nine major European languages, all of them except English. In his book, Dr Amaral mentions how members of the British security services, including staff from SEOP, helped to build a profile of the likely abductor. These men, whose names we don't know, soon put the name of Robert Murat into the frame. We could do a full programme on Robert Murat's involvement in this drama, and perhaps we will. He had joint Portuguese-British citizenship and was fluent in both languages. He had in fact been a police translator for Norfolk Police. He spent part of the year in England, part of it in Portugal, where he had a German girlfriend. For mysterious reasons, he suddenly booked a flight to Portugal at midnight on the 30th of April 2007 and was at Faro Airport in the early hours of the morning. Early on the 4th of May, as news was breaking worldwide of Madeleine's disappearance, Murat volunteered to translate all the interviews the Portuguese police were doing of the McCanns, their friends and other witnesses. During these interviews, he acted so suspiciously and inappropriately trying to sneak a look at confidential police documents on the case, for example, that a police inspector sent an urgent report on his behaviour to Dr Amaral. Gossip about him was fed into the British mainstream media and lurid headlines about him started to appear. His arrest was partly triggered by the work the SEOP staff were doing. Dr Amaral in his book mentions that the staff from SEOP compiled a profile of the alleged abductor, compared that profile with Robert Murat and convinced Dr Amaral that Murat fitted their profile 90%. There is a big question mark about whether that was a genuine assessment or whether it could have been part of a calculated ruse to get Robert Murat made a suspect, as indeed he was on the 15th of May. Authorization for SEOP to become involved at all must have needed authorization at the very highest level. Just who gave the order for the men from SEOP to be sent to Portugal? Before we leave the subject of Robert Murat altogether, here are a number of things for you to ponder about him. 
Murat was pulled in for questioning on the 15th of May by police. In interview, he was asked to give an account of his movements from his arrival in Portugal on the 1st of May to the 4th of May, when he volunteered to translate for the police. During this interview, Murat told the police 17 blatant lies about his movements during those four days. Here is a list of them. How was he caught out? Because several weeks later, the Portuguese police had analysed pings from his mobile phone to local mobile phone masts. These proved that he was not where he said he was during those four days. When these were put to him in a second interview on the 10th of July, he asked for a break in the interview. After the break, he came back and told an entirely different story. He told the police that on the 15th of May, he had been too tired to tell the truth. One of those 17 lies was not to admit that he was in fact at the Palmeiras Golf Club near Lagos on the afternoon of the 3rd of May, about seven hours before Madeline was reported missing. Now I've just pulled up at the Palmeiras Golf Club, which is a few miles east of Lagos, maybe seven or eight miles east of Praia de Luz. The significance of this increases when we consider two other points. First, the mobile phone records of both Robert Murat and Jerry McCann show a most remarkable coincidence. At about 3pm on Wednesday the 2nd of May, both men suddenly switched off their mobile phones within six minutes of each other. Their mobiles then each remained switched off for a further 32 hours, until both men switched on their phones again at around 11pm in the evening on the 3rd of May, an hour after Madeline was reported missing. Again, they did so within six minutes of each other. That raises the question of whether the two men were already known to each other. Now it is alleged that Jerry McCann met with Robert Murat at this golf club uh, before, sometime before, Madeline went missing. So I'm just going to go in, take some footage of the outside and of the inside. Second, on this clip we see Jerry McCann, the day Robert Murat was made a suspect, asked a simple question. Do you already know Robert Murat? But did you know Robert Murat? I'm not going to comment on that. <clears throat> he doesn't answer the question. He could easily have said no if the answer was no. What does his body language suggest? In addition, he looks evasive. The question clearly troubles him. He looks away from the interviewer and hurriedly terminates the interview. If we knew more about the nature of any relationship between Jerry McCann and Robert Murat, we would surely be able to understand a whole lot more about what really happened to Madeline McCann. But let us now return to the subject of involvement of government and other political, media and establishment figures in actively assisting the McCanns. Let's look next at the involvement from the outset of Leicestershire Police. It is far from obvious why the police force in the parents' home county in England should get involved immediately in searching for their missing child in a foreign country, yet this is precisely what happened in this case. Superintendent Bob Small and at least two other officers from Leicestershire Constabulary were dispatched immediately to Praia de Luz. Bob Small was to play a highly crucial role in the decision by the Portuguese police to pull in Robert Murat for questioning. He was directly involved in the events leading up to the controversial event. It was on Sunday the 13th of May, ten days after Madeline's reported disappearance, that Jane Tanner was asked to take part in an identity parade to see if she could identify the person she had seen carrying a child on the evening of the 3rd of May. Significantly, before taking part in this exercise, she spoke to Superintendent Bob Small. Jane Tanner was asked by the police to sit in an unmarked police van with a two-way mirror. She could see out of the window perfectly, while those on the outside could not see what was within. It was arranged for a number of people to walk past the van, including Robert Murat, who now was at least a potential suspect. As Robert Murat walked past the unmarked police van, Jane Tanner became adamant to the police that he was the very man she'd seen walking near the McCann's apartment ten days ago. Within 48 hours of Murat being made a suspect, three of the McCann's Tapas 7 friends visited the Portuguese police, saying they were sure they had seen him hanging around the Ocean Club around 11pm on the day Madeline was reported missing. Thus, four of the group were pointing the finger at Robert Murat. Why did they do this? Were they telling the truth? We can answer that in part by pointing out by the end of the year, all four of them were once again singing from the same hymn sheet. But this time, each one of them said that they had made a mistake and it wasn't Murat they'd seen. But these deep mysteries about Robert Murat will have to wait for another program. So let's now look at another couple of people sent out on day one to help find Madeline. 
or perhaps for some other purpose. They were Alan Pike and Martin Alderton, from a shadowy group called the Centre of Crisis Psychology, CCP, as their name suggests, their claimed speciality was to offer counselling to people in trauma following some kind of disaster. These two counsellors were apparently brought in and paid for by Mark Warner, the company who arranged the holiday for the McCanns and their friends. A Yorkshire newspaper, the Craven Herald, reported on Monday the 14th of May as follows. The two specialist trauma counsellors from Skipton have flown out to Portugal to help the devastated parents of missing four-year-old Madeleine McCann. Consultants Alan Pike and Martin Alderton from the Centre of Crisis Psychology, based at Broughton Hall, have been by the side of Jerry and Kate McCann since their daughter Madeline was abducted. The two experts were appointed by Mark Warner, the company which manages the resort, to assist Mr and Mrs McCann, both 38, on how to best deal with the stress and trauma of their terrible ordeal. Mr Pike, who was leading the team, flew over to the resort with Mark Warner managing director David Hopkins the day after Madeline disappeared. Once again, the sheer speed which these people rushed out to Pride de Luz has to be questioned. The first news that Madeline was missing came out at breakfast time on Friday the 4th of May. Yet by the end of the day, the managing director of Mark Warner and two people from a crisis counselling group had booked a flight, booked accommodation in Portugal and boarded a plane to Faro. It turned out that CCP had a very close relationship with the government, having been used by the government in a number of major disasters across the country. A Mark Warner spokesman said that CCP came highly recommended by industry partners and have been known to us for some time. Their experience in dealing with a variety of incidents is second to none. The Craven Herald said that Alan Pike has been involved in consulting with companies following road traffic accidents, personal attacks, terrorist bombings, shootings, robberies, drowning and staff bereavement. It was an impressive list. Amongst others to have used CCP was entrepreneur Richard Branson. Before the month of May was out, even the Pope was roped in to support the McCanns. This was on Wednesday the 30th of May, less than four weeks after Madeline had been reported missing. The Pope blessed a photograph of Madeline. There was worldwide coverage of this event. Such a high-profile event had clearly been planned well in advance, and it had been achieved by the work of the government-appointed media relations officer for the McCanns, Clarence Mitchell. He didn't actually fly out to Pride de Luz until the 22nd of May, eight days before the McCann's visit to the Pope. But we can be sure that he will have arranged this event well before then. Indeed, Mitchell openly boasted in a TV interview that it was he who had arranged the McCann's to visit the Pope simply by asking the then Roman Catholic Archbishop of Westminster, Cormac Murphy O'Connor. Clearly, as the head of the government's media machine, Clarence Mitchell would have contacts with the most powerful people in the land, and without doubt, Cormac Murphy O'Connor was certainly one of those. The Pope's support for the McCanns extended to prominently publishing on the Vatican website the McCanns' appeal for people to look for Madeline. However, the Vatican has one of the best intelligence networks in the world, and just 48 hours before the McCanns were pulled in for questioning, the Pope deleted the page from his website. No doubt a Portuguese Catholic had tipped off the Vatican that the McCanns were about to be made suspects. In her book, Kate McCann praised Alan Pike to the skies. The effect our conversation with Alan had on us was truly amazing. To say it helped would be a gross understatement. Alan was and remains a saviour. Another shadowy organisation was ready to help the McCanns from day one, the International Family Law Group. This is how Kate McCann describes how they became involved. We received help from a paralegal based in Leicestershire, via a colleague of Jerry's. He worked for a firm specialising in family law, the International Family Law Group, IFLG. So on the afternoon of Friday the 11th of May, the paralegal, accompanied by a barrister, flew out to Portugal. IFLG suggested making Madeline a ward of the High Court, and they did so just a few days later, giving the High Court a range of powers in relation to Madeline, assuming she was alive. It was this unnamed paralegal and unnamed barrister who then suggested, according to Kit, that they set up a fighting fund. Quite who they needed to fight at this stage was unclear. Kate says that IFLG would devise the objectives of the fund and instruct a leading charity law firm, Bates, Wells and Braithwaite, to draw up articles of association. These two unnamed figures then brought in a third unnamed figure into the picture. Again, let's hear about this in Kate's own words. At the last two meetings with IFLG, the barrister and legal assistant were joined by a consultant called Hugh. 
whose profession was not at first explained, just call me Hugh, he said enigmatically. It transpired that he was a former intelligence officer, now a kidnap negotiator and counsellor. We were told that an anonymous but evidently very generous donor had set aside a considerable sum of money for us to put towards hiring a private investigation company if we wished. Hugh had been brought in by a firm called Control Risks Group, which was primed to help. The company is an independent special risk company. Their main line is corporate security. The involvement of government and their agents is unprecedented in this case. But I'm going to go back and consider this alleged abductor. We have the evidence of Jerry and Kate McCann. Jerry says he saw Madeline alive when he did his check on the children at around 9.05 to 9.10pm that evening. Then, so it is claimed, Kate McCann discovered Madeline missing from her bed when she did her check at around 10pm. She maintained many times that she knew instantly that Madeline had been abducted. We know that the McCann's friends, the so-called Tapas Seven, generally back up the McCann's story of an abductor. But apart from them, what actual independent or forensic evidence do we have of an abductor? Is there any forensic evidence? Footprints, fingerprints, hairs, clothing fibres, DNA, anything in fact? Absolutely none. The only fingerprint found on the window was actually that of Kate McCann, suggesting that she was the last person to handle the window, sometime shortly before the police were called. So did anyone hear this mystery abductor, maybe lifting shutters, entering or fleeing the building, the noise of a child, anything at all in fact? Again, absolutely nothing. Did anyone see someone who could have been an abductor? Yes is the answer to that one. Two sightings of a man carrying a child were reported. One was by the McCann's close friend, Jane Tanner, who says she saw a man carrying a child close to the McCann's apartment at around 9.15pm that evening. The other one was a claim by members of an Irish family that they saw a man carrying a child in a different part of the village at about 10pm. There are serious question marks over both of these alleged sightings. Firstly, it is possible that Jane Tanner fabricated her sighting in order to help her friends, the McCann's. There is also some doubt over the Smith sighting. This is because they did not report it until a full 12 days after Madeline had been reported missing. This 12-day period might be significant when one considers that Martin Smith, who reported the sighting, was friends with Robert Murat. The sighting was reported shortly after Robert Murat was arrested 12 days after the disappearance. We could add a lot more detail on these two sightings and why there are serious question marks over them. But we'll leave that for another show. There are many more aspects to this case that we haven't covered, but hopefully we've given you a broad understanding of the facts behind this case. Many of you will be wanting a clear answer as to what most likely happened to Madeleine McCann. Unfortunately, we can't give you this. In this final part of my films on the Madeleine McCann case, we've seen the heavy hand of government involvement right from day one. We've examined the involvement of the security services and of shadowy agencies like Control Risks Group and the Centre for Crisis Psychology with their obvious close contacts with the government. When we looked at Gary Hagland, we saw how he contacted one of his old friends in MI6. It's also become clear to me how far MI5 have been involved in this case, though this has never been adequately covered in the mainstream press. The original investigator in the case, Gonchalo Amaral, spoke in his book of the active involvement of MI5 in meetings in Portugal during the first few days of his investigation. We mentioned the vital evidence of police sniffer dog handler Martin Grime. He told Gonchalo Amaral that on his way back to England he was intercepted by a member of MI5 at Faro Airport. Most likely the MI5 officer wanted Grime to brief him about what he and his dogs had detected in Praia de Luz. We looked at the employment of Kevin Halligan and Oakley International. Halligan employed the services of two men, Henry Exton and Tim Craig Harvey. Exton obtained a Queen's Police Medal for his work in the Ministry of Defence, was awarded an OBE and, most significantly of all, was the head of covert intelligence for MI5. The McCann spokesman himself boasted in 2008 that all these men were top ex-MI5 men. So without a shadow of a doubt, MI5 was involved, 
heavily involved in the government support operation on behalf of the McCanns. There's one obvious question. Why? Was it just because the McCanns or the McCanns friends had connections with people in high places? Was it because the British government was perhaps concerned about the reputation of Britons abroad? Or could it have been something else? Let's just highlight one of the dubious activities of the intelligence agencies, highlighted by a former London mayor, Ken Livingston. I was raising in Parliament against Mrs. up against Mrs. Thatcher the Kinkora Boys Home, where boys were being abused, and MI5 was filming it because they were hoping to be able to blackmail senior politicians in Northern Ireland. We believe there are certain secrets concerning the activities of the intelligence agencies which cannot come out. They cannot be brought forward into a court. Is it the case that if the real truth were to come out in a trial, the state would have to fall?